Welcome everyone to today's um, Raleigh City Council meeting. We are going to start off with um, our employee big idea award. This is, comes under um, recognition and special awards. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, just as a reminder for those who might be watching from home, you know, what is the Employee Big Idea Award? It's a program to encourage our employees to think of innovative ways to support and provide services to uh, citizens and residents in Raleigh. And so this is a monthly award that we use to recognize some of our employees who come up with some really great ideas on how to improve service. So today we're gonna recognize uh, a group and I believe there's a, a single slide that'll come up in just a minute. Uh, so they can go ahead and do that. Uh, today, we're going to recognize some improvements in our major encroachment programs. So that doesn't sound super exciting. Uh, encroachments are things that are placed in the right of way. And there's an application process that we use to do that. Well, one of our employees, Mr. Lenny Wallace, put together a, a group and an idea to streamline that process, working across a lot of different functions, the city attorney's office, city clerk's office, IT, transportation to move it from a very labor intensive paper system to a digital one. Um, and these encroachment agreements have a lot of detailed technical information in them to make sure that it's all done properly and uh, that there aren't any issues. But uh, the routing of all that paper would take a lot of time. It would often take multiple weeks to get the permit approved. And by doing the digital approach, we were able to cut that down to only a few days. So it, it saves a lot of employee time, it reduces paperwork, and increases the satisfaction of our customers who want to get those encroachment agreements out as, as fast as possible. So as you can see on the screen, there were uh, the implementation team of Mr. Wallace's idea covers a lot of different functions. But uh, for this month, Lenny Wallace uh, in our right-of-way review group in transportation is our big idea award winner. So thank you to Mr. Wallace. Again, if this wasn't a COVID situation, I could shake your hand and hand you your uh, your, your little award. And um, you do get, you know, does get a $500 award as a part of the recognition. So we just wanted to recognize Mr. Wallace and the implementation team for their great idea. So thank you, Mayor. That's the it for Big Idea Award. Let's have some applause, people. Thank you. That's great. I'm, I'm glad to see that this is continuing to move along and recognizing people who deserve it. Um, encroachment process can be very complicated. So taking some of that complication and time out creates efficiency. So it's better use of our tax dollars. So thank you very much. Um, next, we have the consent agenda. Um, who um, would like to make a motion to approve? No items have been pulled. Move for approval. Okay. Um, seconded by um, Councilor Melton. Um, all in favor? Okay, clerk, that was unanimous. Um, next, we have public comment. Beth, we set with that. Yes, Mayor, we are. Okay, first I have Donna Bailey. Okay. Hi, my name is Donna. my name is Donna Bailey. I live at seven one zero Rosemont. I want to talk about conflict of interest, and I would like to hear from the city attorney after I make my comments. Um, this is particularly directed at Mayor Baldwin um, and her position at Barnhill Contracting. Barnhill, as we all know, is one of the largest contractors in the state. Her job as director of business development is to bring in business. Her job description is to develop strategy, cultivate external relationships, and lead marketing at elevate efforts to elevate their business and project acquisition. I want to know, um, um, Ms. Curran, what kind of, how do we know that the, the rezonings and all the projects that Mayor Baldwin is voting on and pushing through, for example, the Downtown South project, how do we know that she and her employer, Barnhill, are not going to be benefiting from this? And I'll, I will um, 
listen for your reply. Well, first of all, I don't answer questions about ethical responsibilities of council members in an open session. The proper thing to do would be for Mayor Baldwin to consult with me if and when she believes she has a conflict, which she has always done. There's a council ethics resolution. Um, and to date, um, anytime there's been a question, she's consulted and we've worked through it. And I assume that's what we'll continue to do. But as I said, that's something that um, my responsibility because she and the council are my clients to give them that advice and not to do that in open session uh, before there's an issue that's come up. I would just like to add that um, many council members have had conflicts and they do the ethical thing. They, so for instance, when Mr. Stevenson had a conflict with Kane Realty, he has to be recused because he was receiving money um, related to a deal that, um, or a land purchase that had been cut. Um, when I worked at Holt Brothers, I would recuse myself on any um, city project or any um, rezoning that we were involved in. Um, that would continue. So um, I hope that answers your question, Ms. Bailey. Next, we have Jeremiah Pierce. Mr. Pierce emailed that he was unable to attend today. Okay. Next, we have Lucy Lafitte. Hello. Yes, Lafitte. Lucy, I'm sorry. Lucy? Thank you. Okay. First time talking to council. I live in Five Points. I'm working with um, the neighborhood group um, to keep connected to the city council. And I just wanted to say how excited I am about a lot of good things that are going on in Raleigh and particularly um, the increase in city density at the corner of Whitaker Mill and uh, Wake Forest. Um, I have a friend who lives in the neighborhood just below that. And um, I, you know, that's my backyard. I live in five points. So I just was noticing that there's a lot of development going on and wondering if um, perhaps a small area plan would be a good thing for this warehouse district so that, you know, you all know the virtues of a small area plan. And since we don't have, uh, I assume a small area plan does involve the neighborhood. I'm not sure exactly, but um, it allows it to be more deliberative, I think. Uh, I'm new at this. I'm new at uh, talking to city council, but I would love to see lots of fun uh, out of the box thinking for that area. For instance, you know, maybe there could be um, it could be kind of a small business incubator because of its history. It's kind of been a small business in, um, incubator. Anyway, so I have lots of ideas that I'd like to contribute to my city, and I just wonder if the small area plan is the way to do it. And David, you are my councilman, so hello. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to, um, oh, no, Councilor yeah, Knight, thanks. yes. You okay if I speak? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Lafitte, thank you very much for your good, relevant, appropriate uh, question and, um, and presentation and um, look forward to working with you. So I'd like to follow up with you um, after after the meeting and uh, let's get together and discuss this with you and the neighbors and whoever else you'd like to, to bring. I uh, look forward to it. Very good idea. OK, how do I how do I find you? Do I just email you? Um, sure. That's okay. what I'm doing. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. And I would also like staff just to look at this and potentially come back with some recommendations, Mr. City Manager. Okay. I'd be happy to give you a report. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have Elizabeth um, Isabel Maddox. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Baldwin and members of the City Council. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, pardon? Can you hear me? Yep, good afternoon. Oh. Uh, I'm Isabel Maddox, P.O. Box 946, Raleigh 27601. I'm here today on behalf of Well Tower TP Crabtree Owner LLC, the owner of 5201 and 5301 Homewood Banks Drive. Those are both covered by the Crabtree Village Master Plan. That's PD Master Plan Zoning. I'm here today to ask for council's permission to file a text change zoning to amend the PD Master Plan. 
this was uh, originally filed in 2012 and amended as recently as this September under TCZ 1-20. Now, you know, I, I get that it was amended very recently, but uh, that was a different property owner. My clients have just acquired this property on October 30th of this year, and they desire to execute a different site plan here. Um, and thus, our amendment will simply submit a different site plan. As you know, in a master plan zoning, um, there's a lot of tech, but there's also a site plan submitted. And under the UDO, changes to that site plan are very restrictive. In fact, you can move a building, I think, 100 feet. Uh, and there are a lot of technical requirements that you can't change. So we, uh, my clients want to develop uh, senior targeted housing to develop approximately 150 apartment units in that location. And the senior housing model uh, requires a different building layout than the typical market rate apartments. Uh, the most recent, the most recent site plan attached to the September 2020 um, uh, zoning was uh, requested about 250 market rate apartments. So this will be a, a drastic drop in the number of units and traffic. And I think in this area of town, we, we, we are particularly sensitive to traffic. Uh, so we would request council your permission to file this TCZ. We'd like to, um, we've submitted a, a uh, request um, submitted a request to um, the staff for a pre-filing meeting and we hope to submit a text change zoning uh, by December 1st of this year. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. City Attorney, um, could you respond to that please? Um, you may remember there's a text change on the way. I think it's going to be heard on at your next meeting that sets forth a new process to ask for text change to conditions and and master plans. Um, and that would run them through the staff and they would bring a report to you on that. Um, it would be treated more like a rezoning, which is how it used to be. So right now we're sort of in this in-between area. And these requests used to be made at what we call the petition of citizens where there was a bigger gap between that there was time for staff to bring a report back. So I think you got several options. You can um, uh, authorize the text change um, now and they would go through the same process that new text change would probably allow them to do in a couple of weeks. Or you could ask the staff to um, come back with a report and fill you in on what their position is on it. I don't know if there's someone from planning who might be able to step up and give some comment on it because I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of this. I knew it was was on here, but I don't know if anyone from the planning staff has given it any more um, detailed consideration. Is there anyone from planning who can speak on this? Good afternoon, uh, Council Pat Young with the Planning and Development Department. Um, we are certainly, uh, it, that's part being drafted, the, the text amendment that the attorney referred to. Um, we don't have a detailed timeline, but we, we can bring that forward certainly in the spring um, to, to you all for final consideration. And, and uh, I think we think it's a warranted and you know ministerial, straightforward um, process improvement type text change. So we can. We can get that to you pretty expeditiously. Okay. Um, I think that text change has already been drafted and is ready in front of you. I was, I guess, asking whether there was any comments to this particular request, mm -hmm. how to deal with this one. Because it's in between. Right. Ms. Maddox, I want to a, a preference. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to add one thing. We, we are trying to get this uh, authorized before the new uh, ordinance change goes into effect. Um, as you, I'm sure, know, there's a, a uh, under the zoning process, <clears throat> there's a requirement that we go through a planning commission and city council approval of a waiver since there was a, a, a change to this zoning filed in September. And under, under the new ordinance change for text change zonings, I think we'd have to go through that process. The, under the 
the old situation where we come to you and ask for your authority to uh, submit a text change, we wouldn't have to go through that process. So, and, and so we're asking your permission either way, but this saves us probably a couple of months in the process. And, and my clients are anxious to move forward on this matter. Okay, city attorney. Um, yeah, I, I see Bynum there. Bynum, isn't this set for hearing on December 1st? Uh, I believe that is correct, yes. I was just going to so, say that the current adopted process is workable and the text change that's pending is really process improvement to um, make this a more transparent process for applicants and the public. Um, but you have an adopted process in place and what Ms. Maddox is asking is for you to act under that current regulation to authorize the text change to zoning conditions. And I, I, the city, I don't think the city attorney would disagree that there's really no reason that you could not take action today if you wanted to do that. No, and that's what I said. You can, or they had any questions about the specifics of the that um, perhaps y'all could answer any questions about that. Okay. All right. Well, um, she's asking for the authorization. I'll make a motion to um, to do just that. Do I have a second? Councilor Knight has seconded that. All in favor? Please raise your hand. Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Isabel. Um, Zainab Belosh. Zainab actually has a conflict right now, and she is about to finish up with something and be back on near the end. So we'd like to circle back to her at the end. Okay. Carmen Cawthon. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of the Council. My name is Carmen Wimberly Coffin. I'm a 61 year Raleigh native and owner of Research and Resource. Today, I'd like to focus on the city of Raleigh. She's a beautiful city made up of numerous neighborhoods filled with citizens who either by birth or by choice have made the decision to live here. She is the city of Oaks, known for trees and nature, but also for hospitality to others, educational opportunities from K-12 and higher level, and community, lots of community. She is not a shiny object waiting for glue to add on more shiny objects. I believe that as Raleigh has grown and people have come here, they have come for the lifestyle that they saw when they looked. If they had wanted shiny and bright, they would have moved to Charlotte or Atlanta or New York or some other place. But they didn't, they came here. Some of you came here. We have to remember to respect the people and the communities that made Raleigh what it was before the shiny objects came into focus. We must respect and recognize the investment of time and the working communities, including our ancestry, that allowed Raleigh to get to where it is now. Those lives, that history matters. There was lifelong sacrifice and commitment on the part of citizens to create the city of Oaks. Downtown South will sit in the midst of that space of sacrifice and commitment. For the families that lived and worked in Carolee, Carolina Pines, Rochester Heights, Biltmore Hills, Fuller Heights, as well as for the rest of the city, their sacrifices and commitment to build this city should not be forgotten in pursuit of the shiny ball. No one wants to watch their home place stagnate and die, and the cities of Ra citizens of Raleigh have worked hard to keep growing in a responsible way most of my life. That has included working hard to build a tax base to help provide for the services for the entire community, being active and engaged in the government, giving up property during urban renewal and starting over in other areas of town when promises to be able to move back to the area went unfulfilled. Dealing with increased property taxes now as gentrification changes their communities, as well as feeling pressured to move and or sell the land that they worked hard for. We must value that. We must remember the value of these lives to our entire community. If that means the process of rezoning downtown South must slow down, then it must do so for this part of the community to be heard. And it is incumbent on the developer to do the reach out instead of expecting the citizens to come to them. If it means that a community benefits agreement must be in place for the citizens who aren't chasing the shiny ball to be taken care of in their community as those who perhaps make more money and live on the other side of town would be offered, then that needs to happen. 
If that means that a developer will not make as much profit because they need to spend more of their profits on creating a stormwater mitigation plan to keep further damage from occurring downstream that their development would cause, then that needs to happen. In fact, if the city values those residents as well, they would help with this process as the citizens That's have been living. Your time is up. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much for hearing my plea. Thank you. Next, we have Thomas Kirkland. There. Good afternoon. Hi, Thomas. How are you today? I'm doing well. Um, thank you to the council members and Mayor Baldwin for allowing me to speak to you today um, about my experience as an alumnus of Healing Transitions and a resident of Raleigh. My name is Thomas Kirkland, and I am a person in long-term recovery. I'm beyond grateful to say that I have maintained sobriety since August 30th, 2018, the day I was admitted into detox at Healing Transitions. It's hard to describe and sometimes to remember the hopelessness I felt in the weeks leading up to my arrival at Healing Transitions. My addiction reached a point of compulsive use, and I was very likely to lose my life had I not made it to Healing Transitions when I did. Early recovery is a difficult period, and knowing that I had a safe space where my basic needs were met allowed me to focus on my sobriety while also teaching me the benefit of serving my community. My addiction led me to serving two years of probation through Wake County DPS. Worried for my future, healing transitions played a fundamental role in allowing me to successfully complete probation and allowing me to repay my restitution in full. My family, who were forced to consider that I may not be a part of their lives anymore, have been my biggest advocates. I can remember them coming every Wednesday night to sit with me during the meeting and realizing just how lucky I was for that. My time at HT led me to not only return to school to finish my undergraduate degree, but also the good fortune of working for two local companies that have played a fundamental role in my continued success. My first job out of Healing Transitions was at Jolie Restaurant with local chef Scott Crawford, who I consider a mentor and personal friend. Most recently, I work for Green Hill Recovery, a local business providing transitional housing, clinical, and academic support for young men in recovery. Both continue to be a, to be a valuable source of income, confidence, and personal support. Now more than ever, families in Raleigh and beyond continue to be personally affect, affected by the disease of addiction. Healing Transitions has been a constant so resource for friends and acquaintances desperately seeking help for their loved ones. Healing Transitions made my world bigger in every way, teaching me how to be a part of a community and give back in a way I never really fully understood until walking through those doors. I am forever grateful. Thank you for your time. Sorry, I'm trying to compose myself for a minute. Um, thank you, Thomas. Um, next, we have um, Chris Butnick. Good afternoon, Mayor Baldwin, members of Raleigh City Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, is the timer starting? Yes. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris Budnick, and I've had the privilege of serving the mission of Healing Transitions for over 20 years. A critical guiding principle for Healing Transitions is to provide services on demand. This means people can access services 24-7. This is an important uh, option for individuals, for the community, and for partners like RPD. Continuing this practice has been threatened by an increasing demand for services. Contributing to this has been a 59% increase in Raleigh's population since we opened in 2001. Here's a timeline of our capacity and how we have responded to this increasing demand. Our men's campus was designed as a 165 bed facility. We added 15 beds for a current capacity of 180. We added cold weather mats. We began using cold weather mats year round. Our single night high for 2020 was 241 men in a campus originally designed for 165. The women's campus was designed as an 88 bed facility. We added 11 beds and then another 21 beds for a current capacity of 120. We added cold weather mats. We began using those cold weather mats year round. Our single night high for 2020 was 153 women 
in a campus originally designed for 88. This included 74 women using a space designed for 25 with just three toilets, three sinks, and five showers. Our difficult choice, one, turn people away, or two, increase our capacity. We chose to increase our capacity by engaging in a capital campaign. Our capital campaign will add 200 beds between our two campuses. Our capital campaign will also increase the infrastructure needed to support these added beds. Our capital campaign will allow us to continue providing services on demand. We have raised 11.3 million of our $16.75 million capital campaign. And I'm here today to ask City Council for a $3 million investment in our expansion. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think most of you know that during the bond um, referendum that we just passed, that we often talked about healing transitions being a potential partner. And in fact, money was put into the, um, the bond package to partner with them to expand services and also um, provide housing and care for our most vulnerable citizens. And I think as you've heard from Thomas's um, testimonial, this is very much needed for us to make sure that people can be successful in their futures. Um, what I would like to do, the county um, approved funding for um, healing transitions yesterday at their meeting. Um, this is a $3 million request. I would like to ask um, our staff to come back to us at our next meeting um, with a plan to approve this. Um, I, I would like for them to get together with Chris at Healing Transitions and see what their timeline is, um, when they need the funding. Um, but I think it's safe right now to, um, I'm gonna look to all of you on, on camera this is something we want to do. And if I see a head nod um, or some acknowledgement of that, folks. Okay. Um, unanimously supporting this. So if staff could come back to us um, with that request for the 3 million, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Councilor Knight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh Thank you, Chris, for your presentation. Uh, we know each other and uh, uh, you toured me through the facility and uh, you know, y'all are doing incredible work there and I appreciate all the work that y'all are doing. And, and I know from the tour and from conversations with you and others on the board, you know, my wife used to be on the board that there is a great need for expansion uh, for all the women and men in need uh, in, the, in the Raleigh area. So thank y'all again for all your work. And I look forward to city council and, and city government uh, partnering with you all as y'all move forward on this expansion. And please thank Thomas for the great presentation he gave as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Amy Furtado. We do not have Amy on the call. Okay. Owen Lockett. I am here to support the Wake County Housing Justice Coalition call for Mayor Mary Ann Baldwin and four other, four other members of the Raleigh City Council to recuse themselves from voting on Kane Realty's massive downtown south rezoning application. The reason is straightforward. The council members, including Baldwin, will be in conflict of interest if they vote to approve Kane's rezoning after receiving large sums of money from him during the 2019 election campaign. Also, Mayor Bowen has a contract with Barnhill, which is also a collab which also does collaborative projects with Kane Realty. A no vote, of course, would also avoid being in, com being in conflict of interest. If other council members have received money from Kane since the election, they should also recuse themselves or vote no. 2019 campaign records show the following con contributions from developer John Kane and Kane Realty executives. Mayor Baldwin, 5400. John Kane, 5400. Willow Kane, 5400. Michael Smith, 
Smith, District A Council Member Patrick Bufkin, 5400 John Kane, District C Council Member Corey Branch, 2500 John Kane, District E Council Member uh, David Knight, 2500 John Kane, At Large Council Member Jonathan Mel Melton, 5400 John Kane. We demand that Mary Ann Bowen and the City Council should act in the in the public's interest to vote in favor of a rezoning case to vote in a in favor of a rezoning case after taking large sums of money from John Kane and Kane Realty presents a real and perceived conflict of interest and must be avoided. Thank you. Mayor, you are muted. Could we, could we have your name and address for the record, please? Okay, that was not Owen Lockett. Um, Isha Desai. Hi, um, my name is Isha and I am a resident of Raleigh and I just have your name and address for the record, please. Um, do I have to say my address? Uh, yes, it's part of public comment. Okay, I live in North Raleigh. Um, I wanted to talk to the city council about the downtown south um, development project and um I'm still waiting for your address, please. Okay. Um, I was asked to speak on behalf of someone, so. Uh, do I just for uh, okay? My address is one 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 Level Ridge Drive, um, and I just wanted to. Um, talk to the city council about my concerns um, and the rushing of the downtown south project and I just wanted to urge the city council to get more input from the southeast Raleigh community um, to uh, you know create a better sustainable um, future for that area thank you thank you next we have Natalie Giddis Hi, um, my name is Natalie Giddis, and as a resident of 912 Cheney Road in Raleigh, I'm asking Mayor Baldwin and the members of City Council to vote no on Kane Realty's Downtown South rezoning application. Not only would the project pose the threat of downstream flooding, but it would also contribute to the affordable housing crisis our city already has. Voting yes on this project will only further the ongoing environmental and racial justice issues of our city and ignore the true needs of our citizens. Furthermore, Kane's contributions to the campaigns of council members creates a major conflict of interest should this project be approved. Developers should not be allowed to buy the votes of city council. I'm asking the council members to vote no or recuse themselves to avoid a yes vote that would reveal a blatant lack of public interest and a glaring act of self-interest. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Carmen Allison. Hello? Okay, sorry. Um, I'm going to start off by saying that I do live just outside of Raleigh, but um, given that this, you could know, you meeting regarding... Could you state your name and address, please, for the record? Yes. Um, Carmen... Allison, 13206 McQueen Drive. But, um, you know, given that this meeting is happening, like, uh, regarding rezoning on a Monday at 1 p.m., and, you know, maybe a lot of people aren't here to put forward how this will like, impact them, I think it's fair that I just jump in here real quick. But um, I'd like to speak today in regards to the Downtown South project proposed by John Kane and Steve Malik. Um, when voting on rezoning, I would like to urge City Council to act in the interest of the public rather than operating on Kane Realty's terms and timeline. Downtown South is a massive project and will undoubtedly cause severe flooding downstream to surrounding communities, including Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills, both historically black communities. 
Additionally, it's unfair to plan on discussing and solidifying plans for community benefits, such as affordable housing, after rezoning is approved, and potentially after millions of taxpayer dollars from a potential tax increment grant have already been spent on a stadium and high rises. For those reasons, as it stands, voting yes to approve the rezoning for downtown South would be a major violation of public interest. So today I'm urging city council members to speak for communities rather than Kane Realty by voting no, effectively slowing down the whole rezoning process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have been told that Jeremiah, Jeremiah Pierce has been trying to um, call in. Um, Mayor, we actually, the meeting ended up calling him, and so we do have him now, and we also have Zainab, so we have your two last public yeah. comment people. Okay, if we could um, go back to Jeremiah, and then we'll go to um, Zainab. Good afternoon, Council. How are you doing? Good my afternoon. Name is Jeremiah. My name is Jeremiah Pierce. Um, I'm calling uh, based on you guys' output for... Um, pick up for leaf collection and yard waste. Uh, in your statements, you state that you don't want more than three people on a truck. Well, there's never more than three people on a truck. Um, this is a blatant, you wanna try and save money because of the pandemic, yet still charge us as constituents. Um, right now we have, I am a landscaper, and we are unable to pull into neighborhoods because leaf pickup and stuff has not happened. Um, yard waste has taken over. That is going to um, cause flooding issues, which it did this past week in multiple neighborhoods. Um, it's going to cause problems for our streets. If you guys would like to go to biweekly, that is fine, but you need to um, give us our money back and charge us less. We pay for a weekly service, not a biweekly service. You are using the pandemic as an scapegoat to keep more money from us when there was less money spent in the city. Um, right now, I am driving through a neighborhood, and there is every house has a minimum of 20 bags in front of it, and you guys only pick up 12 at a time. By the time they come again, there'll be another 20, and then bags will continue to pile up, and they are blocking drainage issues and blocking water runways. Um, this is not, this is unsafe, and this is also just you guys trying to save money against taxpayer dollars for money you lost during the pandemic, which we all understand happens, but you don't need to make us pay for other lost funds. Um, thank you so much. Jeremiah, could you please state your address for the record? 9204 Dackens Court, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27615. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. City Manager, is that something you would like to respond to? Yes, Mayor Council. Um, we have made a switch, uh, a shift associated uh, from weekly to biweekly, as you may recall, based on the safety of our crews um, and the associated distancing that's necessary and the slower productivity that that creates. We are planning to come forward to you with an update on yard waste at your December 1st Council meeting and update you broadly across uh, several categories, including that, as well as some ideas uh, moving forward. So uh, what I would suggest is if uh, you're willing to wait for Stan Joseph, our solid waste director, to make that presentation on December 1st, I think that you'd probably have a more informed conversation about that. Okay, that's timely and excellent, thank you. Um, and next we have Zainab Belosh. Name and address for the record, please. Yeah, hello, um, Zaina Beloch, 1316 South State Street, um, Raleigh, North Carolina, 27610. And I'm here to reiterate um, Wake County Justice Housing Coalition's call for um, council members who have received donations from Kane to recuse themselves from voting on the rezoning process when it does come to them. Um, this is a huge conflict of interest and um, in a sense, you you know it's 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 in law. So um, we are really calling on council members to you know follow that law and recuse themselves from this conflict of interest, as well as the fact that you know Barnhill also does um, development or partners with uh, Kane as well. 
And specifically on downtown South, um, I'm curious and really want to um, bring up the fact that I'm I'm wondering of how we can trust Kane to make this make downtown South one that won't displace the poorest of Raleigh's residents. Um, that area is 60% um, people of color and 28% of them live under the poverty line. Not one affordable, not one property that Kane has built has any affordable housing. And this, this will be that this will displace the most people of color, the most people um, who are the poorest. And we have no study on displacement. It has huge environmental impacts. And on top of that, I, I'm, I'm also like saying like you have someone who has developed over um, 1.5 million square footage in Raleigh this year alone um, and has really guided the vision. Yet he's also the same person who's given almost, you know, close to $100,000 to Trump. These are the, I personally, and I, I, and I encourage you to, to really look deep into this and seeing of whether he has the best um, benefit of the city of residents, um, city of Raleigh residents in mind. On top of that, it's on an opportunity zone. So the whole goal was um, to provide benefits for low income residents. And honestly, right now, opportunity zones are in limbo. So I think it would be a bad strategic or a bad strategic decision on um, rezoning an opportunity zone before we don't know what's going to happen with them. Because if the Senate turns over, they'll most likely get rid of them. And they've been shown to only benefit wealthy developers. And specifically, they wouldn't be able to um, build stadiums on um, opportunity zones um, if the Senate does turn over. Um, and so just wanted to give some ideas here. Um, you could put a moratorium on any rezoning requests on opportunity zones because it is in limbo and it's, you know, I think that would be a good decision. Um, and also maybe wait until there's a community engagement process and engage with the actual community. Zainab, your three minutes are up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That, um, I believe, Beth, is the um, end of public comment for today. Yes, Mayor. Next, we will go to the um, Planning Commission report. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Ken Bowers with Planning and Development. Uh, coming up. So uh, we'll start with a review of what's currently scheduled for public hearing on December 1st. There is one street closing, two comp plan amendments, two text changes, and one rezoning today for a total of six items. And we have another five items coming out of Planning Commission the report and recommendation, which could go to the same here. So these are them, uh, Z420 Trailwood Drive, Z2620 on Corporate Center, Z3620 on Edwards Mill, Z3820 on North Harborough, and Z4120. I'll, I'll quickly get through these, and then you can either act on them um, collectively or individually based on uh, whether you want to treat any of them differently than the others. So Z420, this is at 7401 Trailwood Drive. If this looks familiar, you may recall this was reported out from Planning Commission, but there had been an issue at the Planning Commission meeting where some interested members of the public were not able to speak. You sent it back to the Planning Commission and those um, the public was able to have opportunity to comment on this. The commission has uh, acted again. Their recommendation once again is a recommendation for approval and they recommend a public hearing date of December 1st. The next item uh, is at 1100 Corporate Center Drive. This is a request to rezone a little over six acres from CX-5 to CX-7 with conditions. The signed zoning conditions have been received, so it is ready to be scheduled. Um, Planning Commission has recommended approval on an 8-2 vote for this item. 2201 Edwards Mill Road uh, is a request to uh, rezone 40 acres from agricultural productive to OX7. Uh, you may be familiar with this site of the major economic development project is proposed for it. The site is currently owned by the state of North Carolina. 
unanimous recommendation for approval and a December 1st public hearing is recommended. 309 and 311 North Tarboro Road, a little over a third of an acre to be rezoned from OX3 conditional use <coughs> to RX3 and, um, uh, to, and RX3 to NX3 conditional use with an urban limited frontage. <laughs> um, sign zoning conditions have been received. Planning Commission unanimously recommends approval. A public hearing date of December 1st is recommended. And then the last item is a request to rezone um, just under six acres from planned development and R10 conditional use to R10 conditional use. Sign rezoning conditions have been received. <laughs> Another unanimous recommendation from the Planning Commission for approval and the recommended public hearing date is December 1st. So that concludes my Planning Commission report. Okay. Do um, I'm Council Member Branch? Yes, I move for approval for um, public hearing on all items for December 1st. Seconded by Councillor Stewart. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. Um, Ken, don't go away yet. Um, a couple of people during public comment brought up the um, down, downtown south project. Could you give us an update on the current status of that in the planning commission? Sure. So um, the planning commission has uh, held several meetings on this. Uh, the it first appeared on their consent agenda on October 13th, where the action was to refer to the Committee of the Whole. And uh, because of the complexity of the case and the uh, uh, public interest that's generated, they have held three special Committee of the Whole meetings in October and November to date. Um, it has been reported out of Committee Whole back to the full commission, and there's a, uh, a special meeting of the commission following their Committee of the Whole meeting this Thursday, the 19th, to take it up again. The only other development is at this point, um, the applicant has submitted some additional conditions as of November 13th. Um, they could not be acted on or voted on uh, by the commission until uh, their November 24th meeting. So uh, our current understanding of the timeline, them having held all these special meetings, uh, certainly indicates uh, a desire to um, uh, make a decision on the case. Uh, the earliest that might happen is November 24th. Um, I can't say for certainty, but it seems reasonably likely given the deliberations to date that that might happen. If it does, then it would uh, be in front of council on the, their report on December 1st. Okay, so we could set a special meeting on this um, December 1st if we so choose to. You could. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Let's see, our next item is special items. This is the rezoning Z3220. It falls in the Noose Road at the northeast corner with Harps Mill Road. Yes, ma'am, this item was in front of you last week or at the last meeting as part of the report of the planning commission. The applicant asked if you were setting the public hearing until during this meeting so that they could revise their conditions. And what they have done is alter one of the conditions to offer additional uh, stormwater control measures. So they have agreed to control, uh, in addition to the storm events they had previously noted, they have added the 100-year storm event to those that they would control for. And so at this point, we have signatures in hand. And if you are ready, we could set the public hearing. Uh, and that could be for uh, December 1st or the first meeting in January, your pleasure. Um, December 1st, if, oh, Councilor Bufkin. Uh, yes, Mayor, I was gonna recommend the same action that the hearing be set for December 1. Okay, is that a motion? Yes, thank you. Okay. Do we have a so second? Moved. Okay, Council Member Stewart has seconded. All in favor? Opposed? That was unanimous, so that will also be added to the December 1st public hearings. Thank you. I'll see you then. <laughs> um, next, um, we have, um, for information, the Fairview Road traffic calming 
which Councillor Knight had um, requested. The, um, William Shoemaker from Transportation. Hello, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is William Shoemaker. I am over the uh, city's traffic calming program. Uh, as this presentation gets pulled up, there's a lot to unpack here, so I'll try to move quickly. Uh, if, if there's anything, please stop me. I'll go into more depth as I move through this presentation. Uh, so we want to talk about the NTMP goals, the history of uh, what we've done along Fairview Road, the options moving forward, and some ongoing discussions that we've had with the NCDOT uh, for the, that area. Uh, so the NTMP, it, it is the sole purpose is to promote safe and public streets that contribute to positive quality life in the city's neighborhoods. And we do this by uh, the three main tools, which are speed limit reduction, multi-way stops, and traffic calming projects. Uh, Fairview Road is, is a very unique road in, in its construction. Uh, the, the eastern two-thirds is a little bit wider with a 29 foot back of curb to back of curb. With the center line, it's the bottom left picture on, on this slide. Uh, with the slightly skewed center line where we have an 11 foot lane for eastbound traffic, and then uh, an 11 foot lane and a seven foot traffic uh, parking lane on the westbound side. Then at the western third at, uh, I believe, Cowper, uh, it narrows down to 23 feet. So it's a pretty narrow street to begin with. It already it also has a relatively narrow public pedestrian space with about a four foot planting strip and a five foot sidewalk. The current UDO is a six foot planting strip and a six foot sidewalk. So as you can see, it is a relatively narrow street. Uh, the right of way is about 10 foot back of curb, which again, narrow considered uh, today's standards, but is pretty standard for, for this neighborhood in this area. This road does carry a fair amount of traffic with uh, about 4,300 uh, vehicles per day. Uh, we've evaluated this three, four times over the past, and it fluctuates a little bit, but it's around that 4,300 mark. So moving into it, we have looked at and tried to implement uh, all three NTMP tools along Fairview Road. Uh, in March 14, 2014, we reduced the speed limit from the statutory 35 miles an hour to a uh, posted 30 miles an hour. And this was done because of uh, the 4,000 vehicles per day. The NTMP policy states that the streets with above 4,000 vehicles per day can only be lowered to 30 miles an hour. Um, while we were doing a field visit in December of 2019, uh, we noticed that there were a few signs that somehow walked away over the years. Uh, and also from a visibility standpoint, we could do better. So we went through and added a, a number of, of 30 mile an hour signs as well as replacing some that had gone missing over the years so that now the street has consistent 30 mile an hour speed limit messaging from Glenwood to St. Mary's. We also looked at multi-way stops at three intersections uh, in November of 2019. We looked at the intersections of uh, Cowper, Fairview and Stone Woodland and Fairview and Reed Myrtle. All three were recommended for denial because they did not meet the nationally adopted standards in the Manual for Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Um, and because uh, stop signs really are not a good tool uh, as it relates to slowing traffic down along the entirety of the street. They're really good at doing uh, intersection safety and they only have about a 150 foot sphere, sphere of influence around uh, each intersection. So looking at the configuration as well as the many uh, different evaluation factors that we looked at, we did recommend denial of all three. Uh, and the third tool is a traffic calming project. In June 2018, we evaluated Fairview Road, and at that time, it scored enough points to become uh, a priority on our traffic calming list and was offered a traffic calming project. In October of 2018, we held an introductory meeting with the residents along the street in the greater neighborhood to explain the traffic calming process and set up the subsequent steps in that. And the next step is balloting. So we balloted the residents in the neighborhood in 2018 and the ballot initiative came back unsuccessful. Uh, so we ballot the residents and the neighborhood separately. So it's a two tier balloting process where residents, we have to have a 50% participation level. As you can see, we got 57%, a little over 57%. Uh, but we needed a 70% approval rating of those that participated, uh, and we were about 5% shy. Uh, from the surrounding neighborhood, we needed a 25% participation rate. As you can see, 
they participated uh, very well with about a 43 percent. They needed a 60 percent approval rating of those that participated, and they were also about 5 percent shy with only about a 55 percent approval rating. Uh, so at that point, uh, it was recommended for denial, and it did not move forward with a traffic calling proje project and was removed from contention. Uh, the residents reached out to me. Uh, we've been working together for uh, around eight months now, I believe, uh, and requested at the earliest possible date for reevaluation. Uh, if this would have been a normal non-COVID time, that evaluation would have happened spring, summertime, but because of that, it was pushed to September because we stopped doing all evaluations uh, while traffic was very abnormal at the beginning of the COVID impacts. Um, and the reevaluation found that uh, they qualified again, uh, but they scored much lower. So the evaluation results, they found that at 85th percentile speed uh, was 32.65 miles an hour in the 30 mile an hour zone. And if you're not sure what an 85th percentile speed, I like to describe that as you line up 100 drivers from slowest to fastest. We look at the driver in the 85th slot and make uh, all speed limit and all traffic related decisions based on the speed that person is driving. Uh, that way, only the top 15% is really going faster than the speed limit or faster than that. And once they hit about five miles an hour over that top 15%, that's whenever this program really takes a hold. Uh, for, for most uh, typical cases. Um, the average driver speed along Fairview was 27.46 in the 30 mile an hour zone. And then looking at just the speeders, the average speed of the speeders was 33.09 miles an hour in the 30 mile an hour zone. Uh, they did have one speed related crash in April 2018. So we took all this data in, crunched the numbers based on the policy, and it is now ranked 43 out of 106 eligible uh, based on that, uh, you, you recently updated the policy that we want to try up to 20 projects per cycle. So using that, it would be about three cycles uh, before Fairview Road would be offered a traffic calming project again. We're really trying to, the new goal with the policy update was to shrink project times down to about 12 month period. So that three cycle equates to about a three year period before we would be reaching out to them again. Um, and that project cycle lasts about a year. So it'd be about three years before introductory meeting, where if they passed all the steps and about a year from then, they would have a completed project. So the options going forward, um, from a speed, a speed limit reduction standpoint, uh, from a policy standpoint, we staff has already lowered uh, the speed limit to the lowest possible speed of 30 miles an hour based on the vehicular volume. Um, Council could direct staff to reduce uh, the speed limit further and go to a 25 mile an hour speed limit. Uh, there are definitely pros and cons with that. Uh, the pros are if it works, people start driving, if people adhere to the speed limit, people start driving 25 miles an hour and go about five mile an hour slower. Uh, on the flip side of con is that currently people are driving approximately 30 and by artificially lowering the speed limit, uh, a speed compliance issue could be created. Um, not really sure how that would play out. Each street is very unique in that regard. Uh, so that's just the pros and cons with lowering the speed limit further. Uh, Multi-way stops. We have evaluated all three stops, along, uh, three stops along Fairview Road and all failed to meet warrants per the adopted policy. A uh, main contributing factor was the major imbalance in volume. We like to see it about 50-50 or pretty close to that, as well as we look at crashes that could have been uh, resolved with a multi-way stop and site distance issues. Fairview Road met or exceeded all of those minimums and thus we recommended denial. Uh, we do have a pending crosswalk request for the intersection at Fairview at Reed and Myrtle. That's right there at about the midpoint, if you're familiar with the road right there, at the, the Methodist Church. Um, that was made back in, when the initial request came in for traffic calming, where we like to count people, uh, that's how we determine if a crosswalk, it, it meets warrants if there's enough people crossing. I'd like to do that in the warmer months. So it was scheduled for this spring, summer, but again, with COVID, it dramatically impacted how we do business. Um, and that is still pending until uh, the church and some other, the other pedestrian drivers in that immediate area get back to a normal schedule or normal-ish schedule and where we can get a, a really good count. Uh, 
uh, if the crosswalks are met, we would very likely reevaluate a multi-way stop at that location uh, because that adds new information and it would really help prioritize and, and provide additional safety to the pedestrians that are crossing. Uh, Council, you could direct staff to install the crosswalk and multi-way stop at this location at this time, or you could uh, direct us to install uh, multi-way stops at all three intersections. For the option three is a traffic calming project uh, per the adopted policy. And that council action could be right now uh, to take no action and allow Fairview Road to move through the adopted policy to qual of qualifying street. Fairview Road has recently been through this uh, reevaluation process and they're back on the list. Um, the project isn't going to happen in the next cycle, but in about three cycles, they'll be eligible again. Um, at that time, the sentiments of the neighborhood may have changed, they, and the uh, possibility of a positive vote uh, from the ballot initiative may take place at that time. So they are on the list now, and like I said, if all things stay the same and progress as we expect, um, it would be about three cycles. Uh, that being said, the residents can reach out at annual intervals. So we did the evaluation in September. So each September, they can reach out and request a reevaluation for Fairview Road if they wish. There are pros and cons with that. If uh, the street gets slightly better from a traffic calming uh, traffic data standpoint, they could move down on the priority list or possibly be removed completely if the warrants aren't met. Uh, but if they see that conditions have worsened and we find that, they could move up. So it, it could go either way on the reevaluations for that. It's certainly something that the residents could look into doing. The fourth option through the NTMP is the recently added pilot program. Uh, so we can look at new traffic calming techniques and treatments um, where uh, the warrants are met. Uh, the policy does stipulate that there are certain traffic calling, uh, traffic volumes, street width, uh, meeting the specifications of, of the treatment that we are trying. And based on that, Fairview is not a priority ranking in, in that. We, try to, we have to take the highest ranking streets and meet all those qualifications. And Fairview being 43 is, is down the list that it would not qualify under this. Um, also, because of the narrow street width, we could only really do vertical traffic calming elements along Fairview. And based on the most recent ballot, the neighborhood previously opposed the vertical uh, traffic calming treatment. So a pilot using this type of tool would directly contradict the previous stakeholder input. Uh, moving outside of the neighborhood traffic management program to look at a more holistic approach, uh, one potential option would be the Raleigh Complete Streets program. Uh, those projects uh, focused on safety, accessibility, mobility, and connectivity of uh, existing streets for all users. Um, Pros and cons with anything. Uh, any project may remove, may remove on-street parking or encroach into the right-of-way outside of the existing curb line. Uh, currently, Fairview Road is not on their list. You could uh, recommend that we or uh, tell us to add Fairview Road as a potential future project and scored per the adopted policy. Uh, we took a look at that with the Complete Streets program, and it does look like Fairview Road score relatively low, uh, but that was just a first take to see where it would fall. Uh, but that is something that you could direct us to do. And that list is coming before council in January 2021, and it could be further reviewed at that time. Uh, taking a step outside of the transportation department, uh, we have talked with the planning and development uh, department to look at uh, the potential for an area plan. Uh, so as of right now, the discussions that I've had, it the 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 holistic approach meets the intent of an area plan. A lot of details need to be worked out, but this would be a long-term approach for this entire area. Um, and from the scope of that plan, it could be as narrow as just looking at Fairview Road itself for transportation-related uh, improvements for sidewalks and bike infrastructure or vehicles or whatever that entails, uh, where it's not really a, a land use area plan, just really a, a transportation infrastructure plan or it could zoom out a little bit further and take the whole five points uh, neighborhood and all the roads coming out into uh, an area plan that takes a little bit more time, a little bit more comprehensive. Uh, so it really depends on the scope of what uh, we could look at or they would look at in the area plan. And uh, this would be coordinated with a lot of public input like any of the other area plans. 
So looking at a matrix of what we have, uh, what I've laid out here, I'm going to go top to bottom, left to right. So from a speed limit reduction, the ease of implementation, signs are relatively easy to do. Uh, we have to fabricate them, and then the crews have to go out and place them and switch out. Uh, from the customer experience, this will be a new speed limit that drivers need to adjust to. Uh, the negatives associated with this is that it may create a speed compliance problem uh, if drivers decide to continue to drive at their current rate. From a policy alignment, uh, lowering the speed limit further does not align with the current policy and it would require council action. Uh, Multi-way stops, again, ease of implementation, signs are, are relatively easy to fabricate and then go out in place, so that's, that's an easy implementation. Uh, from a customer experience, this would be a new traffic pattern uh, that they would have to get used to. Uh, the negatives associated with this option is that currently they do not meet the warrants per nationally adopted guidelines. Um, on top of that, uh, with multi-way stops, there can be uh, an increase in noise pollution for the homes immediately surrounding as cars break and speed up as they leave. Uh, there is a decrease in air quality with more idling emissions as they sit at one place for longer. And again, uh, multi-way stops do not really do a good job at slowing uh, vehicles down for the entirety of a corridor. And if you remember, they were all really concentrated on the western half uh, drivers, there's a lot of research that shows that drivers uh, can get frustrated that they feel like they have been unjustly stopped whenever stop signs have been placed for purely speed compliance issues. And once they get out of that stop condition, uh, they can try to make up for perceived lost time. And the eastern half of Fairview Road doesn't really have the same uh, road intersections, so there'd be really no more opportunities to stop them. And if, if that scenario does come uh, into play, with this where we stopped people a lot on the western half and that released people start speeding up and creating speed compliance issue on that eastern half where it's a lot heavier uh, with the commercial and a lot more people crossing back and forth between the, the commercial district down there. Uh, from a policy alignment, adding those multi-way stops does not align with the current policy and it would require council direction to do so. Traffic calming project, the ease of implementation, once we get to the introductory meeting, it's a 12-month process uh, once that project is offered. From a customer experience, it's a permanent traffic calming project that will permanently slow people down to approximately the speed limit. Uh, negatives associated with this option is that the neighborhood recently rejected uh, a project that was offered. Uh, and the policy alignment, if, if it stays in the current ranking, ranking, it would take about three project cycles, around three years, uh, before we started working with them again. Moving to the Complete Streets program, this is a longer term design and implementation process. Uh, from a customer's uh, experience, it is a permanent street infrastructure project, so whatever that entailed, and they would have a lot of uh, uh, resident feedback and input, it is a permanent project. The negatives associated with that is that it could remove on-street parking, it could expand beyond the curb lines, uh, so there's a lot of things that with changing how the road network is or how the roadway is set up, uh, it, it would, may cause some negative impacts. We don't have any designs right now, so we don't know what that would look like. Um, from a policy alignment, they would need, we would need to uh, be told to put that on the project list and then score it and see where it ranks. Looking at an area plan, the ease of implementation, it is a long-term design implementation process. Uh, from a customer experience standpoint, again, this is a permanent project uh, where it's a permanent area plan and um, it, it goes in and explains the process uh, for permanency of what, what this neighborhood will look like. Um, the negatives associated with that is that it is a long-term plan and like the previous uh, cell says, it is probably the longest implementation. Um, a policy alignment will need a little bit more direction, uh, but it likely meets the intent of an area plan. Uh, what is laid out for that process. Um, and I would be remiss if I did not bring up the Glenwood Five Points intersection itself uh, in this conversation. So city staff and the NCDFT are having uh, ongoing discussions around this Five Points intersection where the main points are uh, discussing the roundabout concept, the conversion to roundabout, uh, the vehicle flow and the capacity of what that would look like, the right-of-way implications of, of reworking that intersection, access management to all the roads and the driveways and whatnot, and then also looking at pedestrian safety for this intersection. 
And that wraps up the, the informational aspect of this. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to, uh, to respond to those. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Knight, you had requested um, this um, staff report. Do you have a um, plan of action that you would like to take on this? Yes, ma'am, I do. I, if you, others have questions, I'd rather just conclude. Um, I'm not asking for any decisions today, but if anybody has any other questions, if they don't, if you don't mind letting other counselors go, then I'll conclude if you don't mind. Okay, um, Councilor Cox. Uh, just some clarification. There was a reevaluation done in September. Um, I wasn't clear if that included balloting or not, or would we wait the three cycles before doing the balloting? So that was just a reevaluation to see what the traffic uh, situation is out there. We don't ballot any streets until they have officially entered the process. Uh, so it would be the introductory meeting where we tell the, the neighborhood that they have uh, met the minimum qualifications and they are eligible for a project and kind of uh, set it up to let them know they're in the process. Uh, and then the ballot would immediately follow. Uh, what we did in September was just putting uh, the counters on the road, uh, doing our field evaluations and looking at the current condition. Councillor Cox. So um, is it so just to recap, the speed limit is currently 30 miles per hour. And uh, you said the average was 27 miles per hour. And the 85th percentile, meaning that 85 per of the drivers are driving less than 32 miles per hour. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So I guess I'm scratching my head over what the issue is. After we scored based on the uh, the policy, and this was scored before uh, the October 6th where we updated uh, the policy, uh, it met the minimum thresholds for a project and it was ranked accordingly at, at 43. Okay. Okay, and Councillor Knight, you want to go back to the neighbors and business owners and discuss with them before making any recommendation recommendations on this, correct? Yes, ma'am. If anybody, if nobody else has any comments, I would just like to say a few words and uh, thank you uh, to Will and Department for continuing to work with the residents and uh, and owners, business owners uh, in this area. Uh, this has been a long time issue of interest uh, to residents, uh, especially along Fairview Road, but also uh, in the neighborhoods uh, that, that come off of Fairview Road. So it's an important corridor. As many of you know who've driven down there, it is crowded, it's tight, and um, we do need to continue to work to make this more pedestrian friendly and keep the connectivity there for all, all modes of, of uh, transportation, not just vehicular. Uh, so um, I, I'm not asking for any decisions today, folks, see what the, the options are. I think there continues to be a strong interest from the residents in multi-way stops. And I wanna continue to look into that issue. I think the speed limit reduction to me is a no brainer um, through here. And I wanna, I wanna move forward with that uh, issue, but I wanna talk to the residents and um, stakeholders some more on that and, uh, and, and more comprehensively. And I think maybe this may be the way that uh, we can go forward with staff is looking at the uh, area plan for, for really all of five points and this main corridor of Fairview coming into five points. So there's a lot of issues uh, uh, going on in the five points area and Fairview Road in particular. Um, and I think there's a way to look at this maybe comprehensively that we could come up with some of these specific issues. For example, there's less interest in humps, speed humps along Fairview, um, but there does continue to be for multi-way stop. I, I appreciate the last, uh, 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 a window that talked about DOT's work in this area. I have an interest in a roundabout. I think there are others that have an interest in a roundabout um, in this area. And that's obviously a longer term, bigger issue, but it could be part of the conversation around an area plan. So uh, so I'm going to go back and discuss these uh, this report, these findings from from Will and the department and um, and come back to council here um, after I've had these discussions with stakeholders and residents and, and property owners. Uh, in the in the five points area. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have the report and recommendation of the city manager. 
Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, there are three items today. I'm going to introduce the first two items together and then let them go through their presentations one after the other. I just want to make a few opening comments. Uh, obviously, uh, our financial position as it relates to all types of services and capital projects and resources is really very important. And this past fiscal year is certainly no different with the possible exception of the impact of COVID-19 and its impact on the economy and then subsequently our local government revenues. So today what we have in front of you are two different presentations, although related. The first is the presentation of our Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or CAFR as it's known in shorthand, which is uh, basically our full-blown uh, audit. This is our audit review of our financial conditions for the fiscal year ending this past June 30th. Uh, and Allison Bradshaw, our Chief Financial Officer, will talk about that in just a moment. Uh, I would like to say and, and announce with um, great appreciation of the hard work of our staff that we do have a clean opinion. So for the non-finance folks out there, that means we didn't have any major mistakes. So that's always a good thing uh, to end up in that position. And that's why Allison is smiling at the podium. Um, having said that, obviously there, it was a very unusual year related to changes we had to make to the budget to account for changing revenues. And we had a lot of grant activity associated with CARES Act and some other things, which she will mention. As you close up that year, that's our actual financial position as of June 30th, 2020, this past summer. After Allison finishes talking about that, we are then going to pivot to the examination of our current year budget. So current year is defined by July 1st, 2020 through June 30th of next year, 2021. That's unusual. We don't usually do a full-blown presentation at this point in the year, but we're really doing that for two reasons. The first is just the unusual nature of uh, budget and finance in the middle of the pandemic. We, uh, as you may have noticed in your handout materials, and then several months ago, we sent you some additional information. We're sending you more detailed financial information than we have in the past in large part to indicate the level of analysis and scrutiny that we're putting on our costs and on our revenues as uh, circumstances continue to change. So one of this is just more updates, more information, more transparency about our financial positions. I'll go ahead and steal a little bit of um, Mary Vigue, our budget director's uh, point. Um, the general fund is okay in the current year, the convention center fund and the parking fund have really serious problems. So that's the bottom line on those funds as it goes forward. And Mary will explain why, but I'm, I'm sure you can probably figure that out pretty quickly yourself. Um, the other reason we're bringing it forward now is that, um, as you may recall, the budget that the council adopted did have within it a contingency for the potential of an employee pay increase if we were able to hit our financial metrics. So I'm going to go ahead and announce that we are planning to move forward with a 2% pay increase for our employees effective in January. Now, that's a very thoughtful and carefully made decision. Uh, on the one hand, our metrics uh, are meeting or exceeding most of our targets, which was a condition. Uh, on the other hand, we have to be cautious about going into next budget year. I think it's also very important at this very tenuous time to recognize the work of our employees, the, the, the really hard work of our employees. And um, we, we are meeting our financial position, particularly as it relates to most of our enterprise funds. Um, but our employees, uh, like, like many of the people that you would know, are also um, having to deal with the, the challenges of, of the pandemic and in that particular environment. So. We are able to afford the 2% pay adjustment, but I don't want it to appear as if everything's back to normal. It is not. And I think that we will have uh, continued hard work going into next budget year to make sure that uh, we continue to balance the budget based on those revenues and expenditures. So uh, I'm gonna introduce Allison Bradshaw to do the financial statements. And then after that, Mary Vigu and Allison will do the uh, review of the current year budget. So with that, Alison Bradshaw. 
All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, Allison Bradshaw here with the Finance Department. Uh, as the presentation is pulled up today, I will be uh, covering the FY20 CAFR, which is one of the most important reports produced by our department. Uh, in our agenda for today, I will cover the highlights of the CAFR, general fund results, enterprise funds, the city's debt portfolio, and the results of the calculation for excess capital reserves. A memo was prepared and included in the agenda providing a deeper dive into the components of the CAFR as well as the required auditor communication, which is called a SAS 114 letter. Also, there was a link provided to the city's website for those interested in the full CAFR document. So uh, as the city manager indicated, uh, I am pleased to inform you that the city received a clean opinion as noted in the SAS 114 letter, there are no concerns expressed by the external auditor. With the onset of the pandemic in March, the city was able to continue the important aspects of fiscal stewardship. Our strong internal control system has ensured the appropriate checks and balances are in place, even as some staff transition to remote locations and business process. Our, the city was proactive in managing the impacts from revenue losses associated with the pandemic, and I'll get into those details in a minute. Not only were we able to meet or exceed our financial policies, we were able to continue the commitment to fund long-term liabilities like our pension and healthcare costs. The city was able to maintain our strong AAA credit rate. All of these key components ensure that the city's finances remain strong and support solid fiscal stewardship. It is truly a responsibility all of us share and our residents expect. So let me transition uh, for a moment back to the April 2020 council meeting when all of us were at the beginning stages of the pandemic. At the time, we were anticipating a revenue loss of eight to $12 million in the general fund and had concerns for revenues at risk, such as sales tax, user fees in our parks and convention center complex, as well as the county's hospitality taxes. As you recall, city management took immediate actions, which are still in place today, to minimize the losses, and those are listed on the slide. So now to the fiscal year results for the general fund, which is the main operating fund of the city. There are several key areas here that I want to speak to. The general fund revenues did not meet budget, and we collected 99% of the operating revenue budget, which is a miss of $3.8 million. Revenues collected in the general fund total a little over $502 million. At the onset of the pandemic, we had collected the bulk of the property taxes for the fiscal year, so that revenue source was not a concern. One of the major revenues we expected to significantly decline was sales tax, which ultimately landed at a million dollars better than budget. Back in April, we expected sales tax to miss the budget by $4 million. The good news is this revenue source, which did decline when compared to prior year by 6.6%, was positively impacted by the federal stimulus package known as CARES. As part of the act, which was passed in April, there was an economic impact payment received by many Americans. Based on data from the IRS, approximately $8.5 billion in these stimulus payments were sent to households here in North Carolina with approximately 30% of those spending all the stimulus check on consumable goods. Sales tax exceeded our expectations, and I will speak to staff's additional analysis in the FY21 financial update, which is next on the agenda. User fees were also impacted by the pandemic and resulted in collections at 77% of budget. Parks was the majority of that miss due to the governor's stay-at-home orders and the inability to hold programs during the last quarter of the fiscal year. Development services also saw declines in April and May as the department geared up to move more towards online processes and have since regained efficiency to operate many of their processes virtually. 
Expense management was a major focus as we entered the fourth quarter of the fiscal year, and actual expenses came in at 95% of the budget, or slightly less than $506 million. Ultimately, the general fund's operating revenue did not exceed expenses by $3.9 million, thus utilizing fund balance. This was mitigated by, cities, by city management's actions, and I'll also add that Raleigh was well positioned with adequate reserves to manage the use of fund balance in FY20. Shifting now, the city has six enterprise operations that operate like a business and users directly pay for the services. Four of those enterprises met expectations, including Raleigh Water, Stormwater, Solid Waste Services, and Transit. We are aware of increased delinquencies surrounding customer utility bills, and staff from the enterprises are working closely together regarding at, at, outreach to customers. We have detailed the results of these enterprises in the memo, and additional details are in the CAFR beginning on the PDF version on page 172. I do want to highlight two enterprise funds that were most impacted by the pandemic in FY20 and are still continuing to see impact in the current fiscal year. Those are the convention center complex and the parking operation. So the convention center closed in March and with the loss of revenues for those several months created a situation where the revenues did not exceed expenses even with convention center staff taking actions on expense management during that same time frame. The amount of fund balance used was $2.3 million. Council may recall the loss of revenue in the county's hospitality tax for prepa prepared food and beverage and occupancy taxes, which prompted the work with the county and other partners for the 22nd Amendment. The hospitality revenues fund the debt service, capital, and provide an operating subsidy to the convention center. The 22nd Amendment reduced ongoing projects countywide to help offset the expected revenue loss. The chart on the bottom shows the blue and red lines, which are dramatically below the budget lines of green and purple. For the year, this revenue source saw a decline of 21% from budget. We'll talk more about the Convention Center in the FY21 update as the loss of revenue is still being felt within the space and sector of the economy and staff has modeled projections for the impact in FY21. Parking is our second enterprise operation that was most impacted by the pandemic. As we exited FY20, parking utilized 2.6 million of fund balance as revenues did not exceed expenses with significant decline in special event and on-street parking in the fourth quarter of last fiscal year. Parking is an operation that had seen positive trends beginning in FY17 through FY19 with revenues exceeding expenses over that time frame. With the loss of revenue in FY20 and the continuation into FY21, staff also have a model for parking and I'll speak to that more in the next update. So that wraps up the two enterprise operations that I wanted to highlight. The city as a AAA rated entity was able to take advantage of two opportunities to refund existing bonds, thus lowering future debt service payments. There's a healthy balance of debt outstanding that support our general government operations and those that support our business operations. As a result of the active debt year supporting public safety, transportation, affordable housing and parks, the calculation used to determine the city's two-thirds general obligation debt capacity has now been completed. As a result of the calculation, there will not be any two-thirds capacity as we head into the FY22 budget process. And finally, each year with the close of the CAFR, general, general capital reserves are calculated for the general fund. The North Carolina Local Government Commission strongly recommends that local governments maintain an unassigned fund balance of at least 8% of general fund expenditures. The city's policy is to maintain an unassigned fund balance of at least 14% of the succeeding year's expense budget. Amounts over this threshold are then available at council's discretion to either maintain as reserves or to utilize for critical non-recurring uses. 
The balance available at the close of June 30th, 2020 is 12.2 million, and there were several factors that positively contributed to the increase in excess reserves. There are two known factors that will directly impact the anticipated excess remaining for the fiscal year 21 calculation. Therefore, I wanna highlight these as council considers the potential use of this capital reserve. While the calculation for FY20 was actually helped by a decline in the budget, the FY22 budget is expected to increase, which will actually impact the benchmark calculation by 2.1 million. Secondly, due to the timing of collections of cash received for sales tax and the disbursement process, the fourth quarter sales tax, which were most impacted by the pandemic, will be received this year in the current fiscal year. So cash on hand is an integral part of the equation and the timing will impact the calculation by 1.9 million. So after these items are considered, the balance for consideration is 8.2 million, which again, may be held as reserved or used for one-time critical. So thank you for your time today. And this concludes at least my presentation for the FY20 and I'm happy to address any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Council Branch? Yes, first of all, thank you um, for the presentation. And just so I, I'm, I understand a couple of things, um, we used 3.9 million of our fund balance for last year's budget. Um, we currently have no two thirds bond money available going forward at this time. And uh, we roughly have 8.2 million available for a critical one-time project based upon our, our current funding. Is that correct? All okay. of those are correct, yes. Okay, so I just wanna say thank you for the work done in closing out last year um, and coming back with a clean opinion. And um, that's kinda all I really have to say on last year. I'm really interested to see your next presentation. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Guess next we have uh, Mary coming up. Good afternoon, Mayor and members of council. As we pull up the presentation, I'm Mary Viggy with Budget and Management Services, and I'm joined today, as you've already heard, by Allison Bradshaw with our finance department. Today, we will provide you with an update on the city's financial performance through November. Allison will provide an update on key general fund revenues and two enterprise funds that are experiencing major revenue losses, the Raleigh Convention Center Complex and the Parking Fund. Other enterprise funds, such as Raleigh Water, Stormwater, and Solid Waste are performing within expectations and were included in the financial report that is attached to the agenda item. We will not be presenting on them today. I will then provide an update on the general fund, the city's base pay adjustment, and highlight the next steps on the fiscal year 2022 budget process. Mayor, let's just stand by for a second. Looks like we're having a technical problem. So just hold on one moment. I kind of figured that out. It is a bit of a statement of the obvious, yes. <laughs> what do you mean? Story of our lives these days. No. no. I mean, you can't even get to the mouth.
Do you want to, does someone, the, the microphone's not on, correct? Yes, microphone is on. We can hear you. Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm going to have to reboot the computer. Give me a minute. City manager, I can proceed. Um, Mary, I can the slides if you would like. I can. I can present for you from here. Oh, can you? Mm -hmm. uh, Beth, let me ask you a question. Do you want us? Do you want to advise the mayor to take a, just a short break or and reset the reset some things? They've been going since um, one anyway. I don't know if the council has that interest or leave that up to the mayor. Take a short break and try to reset the computer. Yes, um, it's just going to ask if that would be possible. Um, so let's take 10 minutes. Um, it is 2.43, so 10 minutes from now, let's be back, okay? Thank, Thank you. you.
welcome back to the Raleigh City Council meeting. We had a technical glitch. We will now continue um, with the presentation by Mary. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll actually start with this slide. I'm not really sure how much everyone heard, but the last slide was the agenda. Um, so the 21, the fiscal year 21 citywide budget was just over a billion dollars. General operating departments, including public safety, parks and recreation, transportation, and central support departments represented 47% of the total budget. Our enterprise funds, such as Raleigh Water, Parking, Transit, and Solid Waste, represent 33%. As a reminder, general operating departments are supported primarily through property tax and sales tax, while enterprise funds are self-supporting through user fees. Most of our discussion today will be focused on the general fund. I wanted to begin by reviewing what was included in the fiscal year 21 adopted general fund budget, which totals $507.7 million. Due to economic uncertainty associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, we brought forward a balanced 21 budget with reductions in key revenues. We anticipated impacts to our property tax collection rate, sales tax, revenue generated through parks, recreation, and cultural resources from programming, development services revenue, and state allocated PAL bill. Allison will provide more details on performance for these key revenues. To offset the loss of revenue, the, 21, the fiscal year 21 general fund budget was reduced by 2.2%. We implemented a citywide hiring freeze and no new positions were added. Department submitted reductions totaling $2.8 million, including the cancellation of the July 4th fireworks, reduction in professional services and operating expenses, and a 25% reduction in travel and training across the organization. We also reviewed our general fund transfers for capital investments, and we were able to prioritize existing resources to cover 21 needs. I would now like to turn over the presentation to Allison to discuss our monitoring efforts and the performance of the fiscal year 21 revenues to date. Thanks, Mary. Allison Bratcher here from the Finance Department. In the agenda backup, there were several slides dedicated to economic indicators and health trends. I won't go into that, those details, but we'll highlight that we continue to monitor many trends at the national level, discussions on potential federal stimulus packages. We're also monitoring the governor's executive orders and phasing here in North Carolina and specifically local trends such as unemployment, all of these factors would, impl would impact our financial projections. So with that backdrop, these next few slides are dedicated to the general fund revenues, specifically property tax, sales tax, user fees, and the remaining revenues. All of that make up the general fund's almost $500 million budget. Property tax is the largest revenue for the general fund and is budgeted at 256, 257.6 million. Property taxes are on track to meet the budget in FY21. As you know, this was a revaluation year here in Wake County and council adopted a revenue neutral tax rate here in Raleigh. As we built the budget this year, one area that we did focus on was the potential for delinquencies in our collection rates given the pandemic and many households out of work or with reduced work hours. We used a collection rate similar to what the city experienced back in the prior economic downturn of 08 and 09 in developing the budget. At this time, we have only collected 17% of the budget, which is slightly behind where we've been in prior years. However, we don't believe that this is a concern. Staff will be monitoring these revenues in the coming weeks as typically by 1231, we have collected almost 80% of the budget. Sales tax is the second largest revenue source and is most impacted by consumer confidence and economic conditions. So this is a busy slide and the chart has lots of lines. So let me, let me take a minute and walk you through the chart. So the chart shows the 18 and 19 actuals, which are the gray and orange lines, and you can see the cyclical nature and growth year to year of sales tax. 
The solid green line is FY20, and you can see up to Q3, revenues were strong, and then we had the onset of COVID. The dotted green line is actually where we thought FY20 would end. So at that time, we were essentially standing at the edge of the cliff. You can see back to the solid green line, that's actually where we ended. So the key takeaway is the stimulus impacted the economy as it was meant to do. In fact, the chairman of the Federal Reserve has indicated as such that uh, he has said the national economy has not yet seen the impacts of the pandemic thanks to the federal stimulus package. So the dotted black line is the FY21 budget, which back in early April when we prepared the budget, we didn't know all the things that we know now, uh, such as the stay-at-home orders, the impact of the federal stimulus. So again, ultimately the FY21 budget was where, based on where we expected FY20 to end, which we now know unfolded differently. So taking all that into consideration, staff has been monitoring the national sales data, and historically, Raleigh has done slightly better than the national average, but for the most part has followed it closely. At this point, the national sales data has been released for first quarter and showed a growth of 3.3% year to year. This growth figure is about a percentage point less than what, where we've seen in prior quarters. At this point, we only have actuals for Raleigh for July. We have some early headlights on August, but we don't yet have the complete package. But the blue dot on the chart is our assumed first quarter projection based on national data. So using Q1 assumptions, we modeled three scenarios, which I'll talk more about on a later slide, and all three show positive variances to property tax at three and a half to eight, 0.2% better than budget, which translates to $3.5 million and $8 million better than budget. The general fund user fees are development services and parks, and this chart shows the budget and collections through October. At this time, we are projecting development service user fees to meet the budget amount of $13.6 million. The budget was lowered in FY21 due to the uncertainty of the financing markets available to the development community. To date, we've seen a pickup in residential and multifamily permits and are at 37% of the budget collected. The second set of bars shows the parks user fee, user fee budget of $5.6 million, and currently we are only at 9% collected due to the ongoing reduction of programs. Parks remains in close collaboration with Wake County Public Schools, supporting families with virtual learning centers, and are taking advantage of opportunities to host safe park programs. At this time, we do not believe that parks will meet the user fee revenue budget in the general fund for the current year, and staff will continue to monitor these fees. Other general fund revenues are a combination of, quite frankly, just a lot of different revenues and total about 24% of the revenue budget. And I, I want to highlight two line items in this section, the Powell Bill and franchise tax. So specifically, the city's, Fran the city's Powell Bill has been reduced by $2.6 million as part of the state's funding plan. This is a budget item that we already had reduced as part of the base budget. Powell Bill mostly supports the street resurfacing plan within our city limits. We do believe that franchise tax will not meet budget. Last year, revenues were $28.8 million, and we believe, based on the heating and cooling days to date for this fiscal year, we're seeing similar patterns. Therefore, we are projecting a similar collection of $28.8 million. So other revenues are not expected to meet budget, primarily due to these two items. And to date, we are not yet aware of any other line items that will be able to make up for these reductions in this area of revenue. We will continue to monitor. So this chart pulls together all the general fund revenues. So let me take a minute to discuss the scenarios. So in each case, we made projections on spending patterns, primarily around sales tax, made assumptions about potential phasing here in North Carolina, and the possibility of future federal stimulus packages. So in scenario one, this is our rosiest model that we assumed, specifically for sales tax, 
We did assume that the holiday season cools a bit based on headlights provided by Deloitte Consulting and will average about 1.5% above FY20 levels. Q3 and Q4 show growth patterns like we experienced in quarter one, but at a slightly reduced rate. Development activity continues at a strong clip and results are better than budget. And since there is no incremental stay at home orders assumed in this scenario, Parks is able to deliver about half of the budget revenue. Overall, in our rosiest model, projected revenues would exceed budget by 2.3 million. In scenario two, the key assumption that changes are the holiday season. And instead of growth, we assume that spending is flat to last year. Then for the second half of the fiscal year, we mimic last year and have another round of stay-at-home orders issued, which we're already seeing in several European countries, and a similar stimulus package is passed, which helps bolster spending. Development activity meets budget, and since there are new stay-at-home orders assumed, parks revenue is further declined. Overall, in the middle of the road scenario, projected revenues would not exceed budget by 1.2 million. In scenario three, two changes here. We assume that the holiday season is very lean and more or less the growth scene in Q1 is eroded. We assume a similar stay at home order and this time we assume a stimulus package doesn't happen or isn't robust enough to quickly fire back up the economy. Overall, in our worst case scenario, projected revenues would not exceed budget by 5.4 million. So to summarize, these are just projections based on a series of scenarios that range from a positive budget variance of 2.3 million to a negative variance of revenue of 5.4 million. Now Mary will later roll these scenarios together with expense projections to provide the complete impact. My next three slides shift from the general fund to focus on enterprise operations. As I spoke about earlier in the CAFR presentation, we have seen significant revenue losses in the convention center complex and parking. We initially thought the same for transit, but to date with the CARES funding, we believe this fund will perform as expected. So let's review the convention center complex. So staff has modeled a projection that assumes no event revenue for the remainder of the fiscal year. And with the changes to the operating structure, these assumptions would indicate that the loss for the convention center would be $4.2 million, meaning revenues would not exceed expenditures by $4.2 million. We modeled this as our worst case scenario, as currently the convention center does have business booked in the first half of the next calendar year. However, we wanted to be conservative in our projections. In FY20, the loss in the convention center was 2.3 million. So potentially over this two year window, the losses would exceed $6 million. Currently, the convention center does have fund balance to absorb the potential loss in FY21, and this is certainly an operation that we will monitor closely and provide updates back to council. Also, as we work with the county on the hospitality tax as well. The two charts show the interlocal revenues, which are prepared food and beverage and occupancy tax. The green line on both charts shows the dip in April and the slow but steady increase as we exited FY20. The orange line shows the first quarter actuals and a key message here is that slow and steady increases we saw coming out of last fiscal year have more or less plateaued. Prepared food and beverage are slightly better um, and average about $2 million a month uh, than we assumed in the 22nd amendment. On the other hand, occupancy revenues are worse when compared to budget and is averaging about a million dollars a month. The chart at the bottom shows the occupancy collections and much like pre prepared food and beverage uh, hit a, a plateau and based on the current trajectory will not make budget this year. There is a meeting tomorrow with the county and other members of the hospitality group to further discuss the trend. Staff will continue to monitor this operation and will report back to you in the first quarter of the new year. The second enterprise that has been most impacted by the economic aspects of the pandemic is parking. Staff has modeled a projection for parking and based on our assumptions, parking could utilize 4.8 million of fund balance, 
which after the FY20 use of $2.6 million would deplete the fund's reserve. The model continues the impacts of on-street, daily, and special event parking with the assumption that monthly deck parkers, even those working remote, continue to keep their monthly passes. At this time, most of the monthly off-street pass holders have maintained their spot. Given the likelihood that the parking fund utilizes all of its reserves, staff will present to council at your December meeting recommendations for the necessary changes to this operation to minimize the loss of this fund. So that's actually my last slide, but before I turn it back over to Mary to discuss the general fund expenses and the remainder of the presentation, um, I do want to acknowledge that yesterday the Wake County Board of Commissioners uh, approved an allocation to local jurisdictions totaling $17 million specifically to support the police department payroll in the current year. This allocation is a direct payment from the CARES funding that was provided to Wake County. Raleigh has been awarded other funding by Wake County for several other needs and we very much appreciate their partnership on the use of these funds and appreciate all that they have allocated to Raleigh. This is great news and at a future meeting we will bring back a budget amendment once we understand the portion of the 17 million that will be allocated to Raleigh. Thanks, Allison. I'm now gonna go through the general fund budget and discuss our ongoing activities to monitoring 21 operating expenditures. Personnel and benefits represent the largest general fund expense, totaling 59% of the total general fund budget. We implemented a hiring freeze in the fourth quarter of fiscal year 20 and extended that freeze into fiscal year 21 for non-mission critical positions. We have a process in place in collaboration with Human Resources to review vacant positions and move to fill those positions based on the criticality of the need. As you can see in the chart, our current personnel expenses are in line with fiscal year 20, which is resulting in salary savings and helping meet the vacancy credit assumed in the fiscal year 21 budget. While we are seeing savings in personnel, our cost for benefits continue to increase due to a state mandated 1.2% increase in the city's contribution to the local government employee retirement system. Finally, we assumed a 7.8% increase in health insurance premiums as part of the fiscal year 21 budget. And this is resulting in higher contributions to the city's trust fund to cover costs associated with health and dental. We have also been closely monitoring our operating expenses. We have seen some shifts in how we operate as a city with an increased number of employees teleworking and rotating in city facilities. Year to date, we have seen slower spending in the areas of travel and training, vehicles, operating supplies, and professional services contracts. While year to date expenses are lower, the actual budget utilization for operating expenses is higher and that's attributed to the budget reductions that we made for 21. As we move into the second half of fiscal year 21, we are continuing to jointly monitor our general fund expenses and impacts due to changes in operations. We are striving to continue to provide high quality services in a timely manner while ensuring we meet our overall financial metrics. Based on the scenarios that Allison previously presented and expense projections developed in collaboration with our general fund department, we anticipate an overall gain between 3.5 million to a potential loss in scenario three of 1 million. And so, and you can see on the slide, we've added the expenses below the chart that Allison had previously showed. Uh, some of the differences between scenarios one, two, and three in terms of expenses would be the continuation of the hiring freeze and the tightening of that if we needed to in scenario three if there was a full shutdown. And so some of our other expenses we would monitor as well along the way. The fiscal year 21 budget included a 2% base adjustment for full-time employees that was contingent upon the city meeting or exceeding our financial targets. Today, 
as Ruffin has previously announced, we are moving forward with implementing the 2% base pay adjustment for our full-time employees based on our projections. As outlined in the HR manual presented with the budget, this pay, base pay adjustment would be effective December 19th for eligible employees who successfully meet performance expectations on their annual review and, if, and have at least six months of continuous service as of November 1st. Employees will see the compensation adjustment in their January 8th paycheck. <clears throat> As we begin to look forward to the fiscal year 22 budget process, we continue to see economic uncertainty. We will continue to review and revise revenue estimates over the next six months. As part of the fiscal year 22 budget process, we will review the hiring freeze vacancy credit, which is $4.5 million, $4 million to determine if there is enough growth to reinstate this reduction. We do have additional mandated cost increases that we are already aware of in 22, including an additional 1.2% state, mandata state mandated increase for our retirement contribution, additional increases in health insurance premiums, and the fiscal year, I mean, and the 2021 municipal elections. We are also developing a process to review capital needs and review the $13.7 million in reductions in capital maintenance that was included in the fiscal year 21 budget. Our next steps will include another current year update to City Council as part of the budget process, including an update on the Raleigh Convention Center complex as we continue to monitor this fund. We will be bringing back more immediate actions to address issues in the parking fund at your December 1st meeting. Also at that meeting, we will, be, we will seek approval of the fiscal year 22 budget calendar, which will include setting council budget work sessions and required public hearings. The budget work session schedule will follow prior years, including a work session in February, March, and April. We appreciate your time and attention today, and Allison and I are available for any specific questions. Uh, Mayor, before you call on council members, if I could also close with a couple of final comments. Uh, of just, just a, yeah, just a few things. Um, first of all, I just wanted to take a moment and thank all of our staff for putting us in the position of being able to move forward with the conditions that we are in. As you may have noted in the expense section associated with the 21 budget that the council approved, it had several components to it, holding contracts, reducing training, holding vacant positions, frozen, et cetera. When you do that, the organization has to step up. The, the, the remaining folks have to get creative in the use of how they're gonna spend their money. And uh, we may not be able to fill positions as quickly, so existing employees have to work a little harder and also figure out how to prioritize their work. So because of that, we were able to meet our expenditure savings targets in the general fund and places us in this position. So a portion of why we are able to move forward is the result of the organization's response to the budget conditions that are in place. Having said that, there are, you know, we have a lot of success, but there is going to be a lot of work to do next year, as, as everyone knows. And next year's budget process will really be more about the fundamental rethinking of what um, a new budget will look like in the space of the pandemic. Last year, you may remember, we had to put this together in about 60 days, so you didn't really have the benefit of some prioritization choices. But this uh, next coming budget, you will have that opportunity. Um, it, it has reduced our flexibility. Our ability to figure things out is much more limited. And so in order to get back to that position, you may have to reconsider some of your services and programs. And I think that's something you wish to consider. The final thing I'd like to say is um, uh, big thanks to uh, our finance department for the clean audit CAFR. Um, that is a big document and a whole lot of work. And so we kind of brushed past that to get to 21, but I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to our staff and, and our finance department that worked so hard to put the audit together, as well as all of the people throughout the organization, including the budget office and uh, 
fiscal analysts and support staff throughout the departments who help manage the money every day and put the audit together and process the paperwork and, and watch our money. Um, it takes the entire organization for that to come together. So thanks to Allison's leadership, Mary's leadership, and our management team and, and the support of the staff to manage our budget and finance position. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to also recognize the staff and thank them for their hard work. A lot went into this. I don't think we're shocked by anything, um, but it's nice to know we have such incredibly professional and competent people looking over our city's finances. So thank you very much. Next, Ruffin, we have, um, oh, do we have any questions or comments from council? Councilor Bufkin? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I'd add a word of thanks to the staff. This clearly a tremendous, tremendous amount of work went into this today. So um, I heard earlier that we do not expect to have any two thirds bond capacity available uh, for the next year budget. And uh, I was wondering, and it response doesn't necessarily have to be today. It could be in a follow up or in the future report. But I'm interested in seeing some ways that we can use borrowing to uh, help us ride through this crisis. Um, you know, that's part of the reason we put so much effort into earning and maintaining our AAA bond rating. And I know there's other uh, sources for borrowing, um, for, for example, revenue bonds within the stormwater program that we heard about uh, last week. Um, so I'd be interested to see, you know, if one, if the staff thinks that's an appropriate approach and two, if it is, um, let's let's see what we can do with our uh, debt financing to, to help the community get through this situation. Yeah, uh, Councilmember Buffkin, I'll I'll take a shot at that and then see if uh, Allison or Mary have any additional comments. I think there's two ways. The first is the revenue bonds discussion you had associated with stormwater is probably the most obvious uh, current debt instrument we're not using. So um, I think you already sort of discovered that and talked about it previously, so I won't go over that again. Um, with regards to getting through the crisis, um, a better way that most uh, well-run governments operate to help manage through economic crisis is the um, reallocation of your capital dollars as a way of absorbing these significant shocks. So it may not be necessarily that you borrow more in order to accommodate um, the needs, but it may be that you push out some of your capital projects and defer some of those uh, in order to try to uh, relieve pressure on the operating budget. So as you may recognize in this current budget, you've already done, we already did that for the current year with the $13 million um, withholding of a transfer to the capital budget in this year. And then that's a question you're gonna to have to ask in the next year budget as well. So it's probably less about borrowing and more about the um, reallocation of capital. Mary or Allison, do you have any anything else to add on that? I was gonna answer it more from a process standpoint. Uh, as part of the fiscal year 22 budget development, we work on the CIP, which is where we'll uh, bring to council uh, what departments have submitted as their prioritization or their needs in terms of the CIP. And then uh, like the city manager mentioned, how do we fill that $12.5 million gap uh, from where we reduce the transfer this year, uh, whether we bring it back in the budget completely or whether we need to continue to utilize it in the operating expenses. And so we'll be bringing back to council through the budget process an update on capital and recommendations uh, and options for you to consider in terms of how to prioritize and what are some funding mechanisms that we can use in the process. Councillor Cox. Yeah, I just want to uh, say that I agree with the city manager that uh, rather than borrowing money to maintain our current levels of spending, we need to prioritize as a way to reduce our spending. And that might mean, and probably does mean, that we delay spending um, and uh, rather than racking up more debt. Councilor Bufkin. Well, thank you. Just just a brief response and maybe a follow up. I'm, I mean, I'm not talking about maxing out the credit cards here. And what what I'm maybe suggesting is uh, that those. Well, first off, 
um, the budget situation doesn't change the fact that those capital projects are very much needed in a fast growing city. Um, and secondly, what, what I'm really suggesting is finding ways to fund those capital projects so they're not deferred. Um, and we've used debt as a smart tool to do that. Uh, we've, you know, get good marks from the local government commission. We get good marks from the bond agencies. Um, so, you know, we have tools available and I just want to make sure that we look at it and we use them if, if it's appropriate. Okay, any other comments? All right, thank you. Next is COVID. Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this next item is just an, another one of your uh, now typical monthly updates regarded, regarding uh, COVID-19 and the potential impacts on the city. There have been some recent executive orders that have made a few adjustments, but not a lot. Um, wanted to ask uh, Derek Reamer, our special events, uh, emergency management special events manager to talk about some of those things. One thing I will ask, and you know, there's no vote or action, but with regards to council feedback, I'll go ahead and steal a portion of Derek's thunder. Um, we are recommending that uh, you continue your uh, position associated with no special events and uh, public meetings remain virtual through the first quarter of calendar uh, 21. So that would be through March 31st. Um, that's not an administrative decision. That's a council with regards to your virtual meetings. That's a council decision. We can you have administrative authority over the special events, but we would need your feedback and you would need to provide us that indication so that we can plan for that. Um, and so that context will be a part of uh, Derek's presentation. So with that, I'll turn it over Mr. Raymer to make the presentation. Great, thank you, Ruffin. Members of Council, Mayor Baldwin, Derek Raymer, Emergency Management Special Events and Hospitality. I can get the presentation loaded here and we'll get started. All right, looking uh, here, review of the numbers uh, as we typically do uh, here, specifically in Wake County, uh, just shy of 25,000 confirmed cases. Uh, 278 people have died from coronavirus here in Wake County alone. Uh, you can see the numbers have been rising uh, since about the beginning of October here in Wake County, uh, that steady continued growth that we really saw peak in July is now uh, establishing a new peak here as we move into November. Looking across the state, um, and since this slide was done last night, uh, that 314,000 cases has now gone up uh, another over 3,000 to 317,495 uh, cases. Uh, on Monday, our seven-day average of new cases hit an all-time high of 2,764, and our percent positive rate in North Carolina is at 8.1%, well above the 5% that we hope to achieve. You can see a sharp, uh, uh, stark uh, increase in our hospitalizations here in North Carolina. Uh, currently, uh, that number has actually gone up since yesterday to 1,501 people now hospitalized in North Carolina with COVID-19. So uh, that's an uptick in our cases for sure. Um, I wouldn't say a surge quite yet, but definitely an uptick. Uh, our hospitalizations are at an all-time high. Uh, that 3,000 new cases in one day, that was hit for the first time just a couple days ago and recently hit just a second time. Uh, that's concerning. And a lot of these cases are being traced back to problems with that personal social behavior, small group gatherings. And we'll continue to see that increase as we move into the fall and winter and the upcoming holiday season. Uh, the CDC is anticipating that those cases will continue to increase in the coming months, and that's really attributed to people spending more time inside. Uh, the safest way to celebrate Thanksgiving and the upcoming, upcoming holiday season is to really only gather with those people in your household. And that same guidance still applies across the board, the three W's, limit your exposure to large groups, and stay home if you're feeling sick. As a reminder, North Carolina is still in phase three. Uh, it began back on October 2nd and has been extended a couple of times. 
Uh, with fa with phase three, we saw uh, the outdoor seating at bars be allowed. So movie theaters, arenas, and other performance venues were allowed to open at reduced capacity. One thing that changed just last week, uh, our mass gathering limit for indoors uh, was dropped from 25 down to 10. Uh, however, that does not apply to some of those other business operations that were allowed to open in phase three or to schools. Uh, so there's a lot of nuances to this, but this is really focused on those intimate family gatherings and social gatherings. Uh, we really want to limit those uh, to 10 people inside. Outdoor mass gatherings still remain at 50 people. So how does that affect the city of Raleigh? Uh, when we look at parks rentals, uh, those are now, those indoor rentals will now be required to adhere to that 10 person gathering limit, which again started back on the 13th and as of now is scheduled to go through December 4th. Uh, Parks has been working very hard uh, with all those folks who have things uh, scheduled to make sure that we are falling in line with the new executive order. Um, and some of those events that have more than 10 people, uh, they will work with them to find a combination of other rooms or outdoor space to move those groups to, uh, reducing the number of attendees, uh, relocating to another appropriate site, uh, rescheduling, postponing, or anything, even canceling if it needs to be. The point is, with the parks rentals inside, uh, staff is working very diligently uh, with those who have scheduled these spaces to make sure that they're not only following the letter of the law, but we're also doing things to keep people safe. When we move on to parks programming, uh, most of that programming is actually outdoors. Uh, there is some indoor programming, and this was mentioned earlier by Allison, uh, the virtual learning uh, support centers that we're putting on, uh, some before and after school track out programs, and a lot of classes and seminars where people are inside the building but remain seated, which is a much safer option. Uh, all of those programs uh, have people go through wellness checks upon entry, and they have very strict protocols on how things will be handled to keep everybody safe. When we look at the Raleigh Convention and Performing Arts Complex, uh, staff's been working very hard over there to try to make up for some of that deficit that we heard about earlier. Uh, they've worked really hard in creating some client-facing guidelines so some of our sport and retail clients can safely host events in our facilities. Uh, they've added some contract addendums in there to make sure that anybody coming to Raleigh understands our local rules and regulations and make sure that they abide by those so any event that does happen, happens safely. And they're being very forward-facing with this and making sure that there's checklists available early on so those that are planning understand what the challenges here are in North Carolina and in Raleigh, and they're doing their best to make sure that they can uh, host safe events. Looking at special events, uh, as Ruffin mentioned, uh, we're currently canceled through the end of the year. Uh, we would like to cancel those through the end of March. That gets us through the first quarter, quite honestly. Uh, we don't expect to be really in a different position uh, then than we are now. Uh, while things are looking optimistic with a, a vaccine at some point, uh, the rollout of that will take considerable time. And uh, we just don't think that we're going to be in any better place uh, throughout that first quarter of next year to allow big mass gatherings. Uh, we will allow a couple of uh, smaller events that have less than 50 people outside, like a neighborhood block party, as we have this entire time. Uh, looking at meetings, uh, again, as uh, Ruffin mentioned, uh, based on that current rise, uh, the colder months, uh, we recommend to you, again, it's your choice, uh, that City Council meetings and Planning Commission meetings continue to remain virtual through March 31st of 21. One thing I will note that uh, we have had success in our public facilities uh, with our uh, enhanced uh, sanitation protocols and wellness screenings. And so those facilities will remain open and we continue to offer uh, limited in-person services. Uh, obviously to keep the, our staff uh, safe, we encourage that teleworking and the staggered schedules as we have this entire time. But uh, for those in-person services, we've done a, a good job in, in, in those screenings and protocols, and we want to make sure that we're still providing that level of service to the community. So uh, looking ahead, uh, we're going to continue to monitor the trends as we move into the winter months and the flu season, and we're going to adjust accordingly. Uh, we're flexible. Uh, we're going to continue to prioritize the safety uh, and continuing to follow those guidelines from the county, the state, and the CDC. Um, 
And then finally here, uh, as technology has it, I was able to watch the governor's press conference, which was happening just a few minutes ago, uh, and, and seeing if there was any new information that came out of that that would change some of the numbers and the information here in this presentation, which it did not. I can say really it was a, a rollout of a new program that gives color coding to different uh, counties within the state to really highlight those counties that are uh, in worse shape than others. Uh, Wake County is yellow uh, right now. There's also an orange and a red category. So it gives an idea on where certain counties are, and it's based off a number of metrics we can discuss later. Um, however, it's important to note that you know no, no new restrictions came out of today's uh, uh, guidance from the governor. Uh, however, he did mention that if we can't get this under control, uh, additional executive orders and restrictions might come back. So with all of that, I'll be happy to take any questions you all might have. Um, Council Member Branch. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Derek, for the presentation. Um, as some of you all, as all of you know, recently last week, um, it was announced that the 27610 zip code had one of the highest um, positive tests in the state, um, has the highest. And um, I was able to reach out to our friends over the county and pull some data from them, and I will share that with you, Derek, I'll forward this to you all. Um, we had over 3,000, we year to date, and let me be specific, this is year to date. We've had over 3,000 positive tests in the 27610 zip code, but we've also had high numbers in the 27606, the 27616, the 27603. Um, those were the top four in Wake County. Um, overall, and this is, I just have Wake County data. Um, with one of the concerns that I constantly see and I'm getting calls on are some of our establishments um, within the zip code that um, people congregate at uh, for various reasons. So my question, my first question is, is there anything from an enforcement standpoint that we can do or partner with the county on to try to um, reinforce the importance of social distancing and keeping people safe. Yes, that's a, a great uh, question there, Mayor Pro Tem Branch. Uh, I can say uh, part of my staff has actually been out working. Uh, we've been focusing heavily on a lot of the entertainment district and the bars. And what we've been doing is going out doing an educational campaign, working with people. A, a lot of the restrictions that are in place are, are confusing and people don't understand them. And that's a lot of the reason why uh, they're not necessarily complying. So uh, we would be happy to work with, with anybody else uh, or any areas, problem areas that you have uh, in working to educate the, those business owners in those areas to make sure that they do understand uh, not only the, the, the governor's orders, but why it's important to do that. And so uh, we'd be happy to continue that educational campaign to really make sure that everybody's striving uh, to keep us all safe. Okay. I've received multiple calls around sweepstakes locations. Um, so if we could you know, look at some of those establishments and making sure that they're following proper protocol um, under the, the state ordinance. Um, also, can we, if the mayor is okay with this, can we reach out to the county and have someone from the county come and present to us on the numbers, um, tracing what what is what the help from the health side, what is going on to um, help reduce these numbers um, and educate the community as well as what some things that you know we're more physical directed, you know, building a debt directed from a city standpoint, but since they're the health department, can they come in and, and provide some data, some information and education? Um, because some citizens, they watch us, but they don't watch the county commissioners um, and vice versa. So I think having that information brought here could possibly be useful. Derek, what do you think? Sorry, I had to get unmuted there. 
Yeah, I, I think we, I can certainly reach out to my partners over at uh, Wake County and see if they uh, can uh, either come in and present or perhaps we can put together a report. I know there's been a lot of different initiatives that they've been working on. I, I know you've been familiar with some of the mask initiatives. Uh, over 100,000 masks have been distributed uh, mainly in 27610, uh, but obviously there remains a gap. And, and so uh, if, if you don't mind, I can uh, reach out to the county and see if we can find uh, the best solution to bring back some of those concerns uh, to, to council. Okay, thank you. And the last thing, Mayor, I have is that one thing I want to say about these numbers, I know the county has made a big focus uh, within my district because of um, the cost, you know, health disparities um, and things of that nature that have impacted people greatly. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of essential workers that live in the 27610 zip code. So I know from looking at the numbers, um, there's a big gap in the number of testing that has occurred in my zip code um, compared to others. And I think we need to make sure that we don't let people think, oh, this you know, virus is just impacting one part of the city. Um, this thing has no zip code boundaries. Um, and it's important that everyone um, gets tested and they do the testing numbers based on your home. So even if you go to a zip, an area and get tested, they count it towards your home zip code. So I just implore everyone, please, if you're out and about, get tested. And for Thanksgiving, Zoom home. Councilor Bufkin. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I, won't, I won't repeat many of the comments that I agreed with in um, Mayor Pro Tem Branch's remarks there. Um, Education and enforcement are, are important parts of this. I might even go further and ask whether we need to consider whether we have the right regulations in place. Um, with these rising case numbers, you know, this is a serious situation and everything we're hearing from health experts is it gonna get worse in the next two to three months. And um, I think it might be time to um, get back to a more serious response. You know, we're, we're all tired of this. We're all weary of staying home and not being able to do things we like to do. Um, but this is a serious situation. It requires a serious response. And um, I think it may be time for us to reevaluate some of the decisions that we made early on and and uh, maybe consider bringing back some of those uh, more severe restrictions so that we can keep our community safe and uh, keep folks alive. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Derek. Um, done a lot of great work um, since this hit and wanna thank you and your team. And um, I also know like all the enforcement that you have been doing, um, restaurants, bars, whatnot, very much appreciated. So good job. Thank you. Yes, Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, that ends the manager's report. Before I um, we go on to the next item, I did want to just ask if the council was comfortable with uh, Derek's statement uh, about public meetings and, and more so about public meetings, but also special events. Assume that 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 is your that is your will, and we will make the communication to the public to that effect. Get nods, I guess. Um, that, that kind of thing. I'm seeing the nods, and um, I think that is the wise decision at this point. Nothing is going to change. We have a very tough winter to get through. I think staying safe and keeping our community safe needs to be our number one priority. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Okay, thank you. All right, now we have matters scheduled for public hearing. Um, we're going to start with item one, um, which is the public nuisance abatement, um, abatement property liens. No one has signed up for this. Do we have anyone here from housing and neighborhoods? I think the staff, I'm sorry, Mayor, uh, the staff is here and be able to answer questions. Uh, they could go through the presentation. You know, uh, Bryce Abernathy is here. You may you may just want to hold the public hearing. It's up to you. Well, no one has signed up to speak. Does any um, council member have a question? Okay, I'm gonna open the hearing, close the hearing. Do you have a motion to approve? 
Move to approve. Do I have a second? Councilor Bufkin, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you very much. That was unanimous clerk. Next is rezoning Z3119-522-828 Needham Road. That um, hearing is still open. Um, Bynum? That's right. The hearing was opened at the last meeting and continued to today. We had asked for some additional transportation information, which was provided as backup in the agenda. Jason Myers from the Office of Transportation Planning is here. If you have questions about that material, uh, at this point, you could uh, further defer action, leave the hearing open, or you could close the hearing and take action or close the hearing and allow the applicant to modify their case if they are interested in offering additional or revised conditions related to the case. Do we know that revised conditions will be added? No, I'm just saying that if they wanted to do that, they could. Okay. So that's, those are procedural options not tied to desire that I know of. Okay. Does any council member have a question? So I am going to then close the hearing. Um, we had it open last time. Hold it open, waiting to get the information on transportation. Hearing is now closed. Um, any? Council, Ma Madam Mayor, um, yes. I, I had asked for us to continue this. Um, I, I did speak with our transportation director. And again, we still do not have the full scope of um, really funding. This comes down to funding for Buffalo Road. Um, planning hasn't been funded or the implementations. I do know this project and the next project, I know the next project has road improvements included in it. This one is filled, is a feeder into Buffalo and because it's a feeder and it is all residential and housing, um, I'm actually going to, sorry about that, I'm going to move to adopt the proposed consistency statement consistency statement dated November 17th, 2020, containing the agenda materials and to approve the zoning amendment with the adoption and effective dates described in the agenda items under recommended action. This approval is also deemed an amendment to the 2030 comprehensive plan and the future land use map to the extent described in the adopted consistency statement. Okay, do we have a second? Um, Council Melton has seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Um, that was unanimous, Clerk. Now, I think, um, May Pro Tem, one of the things that you'd like to raise then is just the level of Buffalo Road um, in terms of how we are going to um, deal with some of the critical transportation needs we have. So we'll We'll refer that back to the city manager and perhaps we will have a work session on that um, in January. You'll be gone by then, but still. <laughs> uh, I can certainly write that down for the next city manager to consider. Okay. Yes, thank that's you. right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. Next we have. We have zoning, um, or I should say rezoning Z24-206125 Buffalo Road. This, um, let me see, Bynum. Is there, this we also kept open. Are we having this a check? Is, this is Bynum Walter with Raleigh Planning and Development. So this public hearing is still open. It was opened at the uh, most recent council meeting, again, held over for traffic concerns, but also for stormwater concerns. We provided additional uh, information in weekly report and also the agenda backup on those two topics. Uh, Wayne Miles from Stormwater and Jason Myers from Office of Trans Transportation Planning are both here 
to answer questions. Again, you have the same procedural options. Uh, you could uh, hold the hearing open, defer action. You could close the hearing and take action or uh, see if the applicant wants to make any revision to the case. Again, those are just procedural options. I'm not forecasting anything. Okay, um, no one has signed up to speak who's opposed. Um, Councillor Cox, you have Yes, I, I do have a question. I, I spoke with Lori Hare who uh, presented to us uh, during the hearing uh, last time about her stormwater concerns. And uh, I understand from her that um, the developer has agreed uh, to help them uh, install some pipes to uh, deal with some of the stormwater issue. And in, in addition to our own requirement of a 100 year uh, building to a 100 year storm, it looks like the applicant is online, or at least their attorney. And I was wondering if uh, it would be possible to bring them in to um, talk about this and provide some more details, particularly about the um, arrangement for installing uh, drainage pipe. Okay, I'm going to close the hearing and I'm going to ask if Jamie um, is available. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Mayor. Jamie Schrather with Parker Poe at 21 Street. Um, that's correct, Councilmember Cox. We did reach back out to Ms. Hare after uh, the public hearing, and although we're not required to do um, uh, off site improvements, um, you know, in addition to the 100 year storm treatment at our on our property, we offered to um, improve the storm ditch that's on the 6400 Buffalo Road property. Um, we made an initial offer that um, Ms. Hare's uh, mother declined and asked us to consider a piping option instead, uh, which we're preliminary, which we, we, are, we are agreeing to do in principle, but not able to make that part of the zoning case uh, to date right. since it so far exceeds what uh, uh, certainly an impact from our development. Um, and the majority of the impact is coming from the Stone Ridge um, neighborhood. So we've kind of uh, reached a, a, a terms, a, a kind of informal agreement of um, the type of pipe and the length that the stormwater department um, has recommended. But of course, all of that will have to be designed and approved by uh, the city through uh, some sort of uh, process that will be separate and following the hearing. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. I, I wanted to uh, get that on the record and um, and I appreciate you uh, uh, stating that. And obviously, I think the city attorney will agree that uh, we can't add a condition about improvement on a different property um, to a zoning case. And uh, so uh, I, I appreciate that you're working this out uh, with the neighbors there. Um, so what I would like to do then is to read the following consistency as statement for approval. Um, I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated November 17, 2020, contained in the agenda materials and to approve the zoning amendment with the adoption and effective dates described in the agenda item under the recommended action. Council um, Mayor Pro Tem Branch has second that, all in favor? Opposed? No one is opposed. Jamie, um, please um, pass on to the builder that um, we appreciate him willing to assist with this. That um, definitely um, makes this, well, sends the right message of cooperation and respect for others. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All right, next we have rezoning Z3320, 7900 Creedmoor Road. Um, no one has signed up to speak against this. Um, I believe Molly Stewart and Joe Whitehouse have um, signed up to speak in support. Can we get a brief staff overview on this? Good afternoon. Uh, so this is... Uh... C3320, this is a request to rezone. And really what's going on here um, is an expansion of the existing use. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just pulling up my slides because I can't see what you can see. Um, we can't so this see is going. 
You can't see it either. Okay. Yeah, so, um, Give me a second and I'll pull it up. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going. So this is a request to rezone just over 10 acres from R6 to R10 with conditions. It is consistent with the future land use map, and the Planning Commission did recommend approval. So there's a um, pretty uh, significant uh, congreg congregate care facility here currently, uh, and they're just going to expand that use. There are a couple of conditions proposed here. Um, so uh, they've prohibited some primary uses, boarding house, dormitory, fraternity, sorority, monastery, convent, orphanage, basically uh, congregate lodging that's not uh, age restricted. Um, and then they have provided that for no less than 30 years after the date of issuance of the uh, first certificate of occupancy, a, a minimum of 80% of occupied dwelling units uh, with tenants 55 and older, and then uh, limited the total number of dwelling units to no more than 85. Uh, so expanding their uh, current entitlement, but also within limits. Um, and so the um, residential density is uh, uh, goes to about a little bit over eight units an acre, uh, and the setbacks are constant, not changing. Um, so, again, consistent with the future land use map, consistent with the comprehensive plan overall, uh, one inconsistent policy related buffering, just considering that there is some residential single family adjacent, uh, but the planning commission does recommend approval. What questions could I answer for you before you open the public hearing? If we could take down the um, presentation so I can see everyone. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Councillor Cox? I was just wondering what kind of uh, public engagement was in, involved with this rezoning case. Uh, I assume there was at least one neighborhood meeting. I was wondering if there was anything beyond that. We have, I believe there was, oh, I, believe, I believe there was the one neighborhood meeting uh, in addition to planning commission review. And the applicant may be able to speak to further efforts that they organize. Yeah, do we have Molly on the phone? Yes, thank you, Mayor Baldwin. Uh, this is Molly Stewart, Morningstar Law Group. Um, yes, so we, we did, uh, in fact, hold the, the two neighborhood meetings. And I know that the applicant has, in fact, done a lot of separate outreach uh, on the side as well. And we have Joe Whitehouse with us on the line today, and I think he can talk a little bit more about that. So you had the two neighborhood meetings and additional meetings. I haven't opened the hearing yet. I wanted everyone to respond to Councillor Cox's question. Um, Joe, if you have a moment, if you wanted to add to that. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, yes, we made a very concerted effort. We had reached out to every adjoining property owner in advance of the initial meeting, uh, had had conversations with each of them to explain what we were uh, proposing with the rezoning, and our response so far has been very good uh, from the surrounding neighborhood, and, and I don't think there's anybody in opposition to us. And we were uh, uh, several of the conditions that we've placed on this uh, rezoning request are directly from uh, concerns that we received from the neighbors, uh, uh, conditioning this to be basically a, a senior housing community for the next 30 years and also limiting the number of units uh, that we have for the rezoning itself. Both were in response to concerns from the neighbors that satisfied their concerns. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I, since there's no one here, no more questions, um, I'm going to open the hearing. Um, Molly, um, if it's okay, I'm also going to close the hearing. I'm going to ask for a motion. That would be fine. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Bufkin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I move to adopt the proposed consistency date statement dated November 17, 2020 contained in the agenda materials and to approve the zoning amendment with the adoption effective dates described in the agenda item under recommended action. Do we have a second? Councilor Knight has seconded that. All in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay. 
That was unanimous, Clerk. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Molly and Joe, for waiting it out with us. Next, we have the report and recommendation of the Economic Development and Innovation Committee, Councilor Melton. No report, um, no items pending, and we do not have uh, any meetings um, scheduled for the rest of the year. Okay. Growth and Natural Resources, Councilor Stewart. Uh, same. We have no report, no items, and no meetings scheduled at this time. Okay. Um, safe, Fiber and Healthy Community. Um, we will be meeting at 1130 um, to discuss um, text change on outdoor seating and annex zoning districts. Transit and Transportation Committee. Um, no report. We will be meeting on next Tuesday, the 24th at 3 p.m. virtually to discuss um, our parking for downtown business owners. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have the report from the mayor and city council. I'm um, going to start with Councillor Knight. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, let's see, three quick things. Um, as I think everybody's aware, we, we had a very big uh, water main break on Glenwood Avenue um, yesterday. Uh, I think it was Monday night, overnight, um, really discovered by the public. Uh, uh, soon after that, uh, because of this, this is one of our most major and important thoroughfares corridors. Um, and uh, I, I, I think I've read that we're hoping by Thursday to get that fixed and that road back open. Obviously, this is a big um, issue for the for everybody in the city of Raleigh, especially those in District D. E. City Manager, do you have any updated report real quick since uh, to give? Uh, I'm calling you off. I didn't. I didn't. Uh, ask you to prepare for this. I just didn't know if you had anything to say about it. Uh, any updates for the public? Uh, thank you, Mr. Knight. Uh, no, I don't have any specific updates. I do. I mean, um, uh, Raleigh Water has been pushing out updates as soon as available through their Twitter feed and through communications to the public. So actually, uh, I'm learning about it just as fast as everybody else. So I think that Thursday date is the current target with understanding of. Uh, if there's any operational impact. So they're working really, really hard. Good. Yes, thank you. I think the communication uh, on this has been helpful. So everybody keep looking at our website and Twitter to get uh, more updates. Thank you. I do plan to have a, a small business forum in December that will focus on District D, but will obviously have ramifications for the whole city. And I will get back to everyone on the specific time and date on that. Um, and lastly, just I hope everyone can have a, uh, uh, appropriately socially distance um, Thanksgiving and uh, meaningful one and uh, uh, look forward to everybody taking a break and getting back uh, getting back seeing everyone in December. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ford. I know update today, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Cox. Uh, I don't really have any uh, items, but I did uh, want to ask uh, for clarification. Um, I could have sworn earlier today that, um, Mayor, I heard you say something about a special meeting on December 1st, and, and I wanted to understand there was no, there is no special meeting on December 1st? No, December 1st is our regular council meeting. Okay, I, I thought you referred to it as a special meeting. I, I thought no. maybe I was missing something. Okay, thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, Council, I mean, May Pro Tem Branch. Um, just wish everyone a safe Thanksgiving or hot turkey day. Um, however way you, you feel your family um, will be spending the holidays next week. Um, just be safe so that we all can see 2021 come. Council Member Bufkin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have uh, no report today, but I join in uh, wishes for a happy Thanksgiving to each of you and all our city staff, everyone in the community. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Buff uh, Melton. No report. Council Member Stewart. I have two quick things. Um, one, Council Member Melton and I will be hosting a virtual town hall for renters on Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, notice has been going out for that. So, um, we're really looking forward to hearing from that um, subset of our community. 
Um, also, it has come to my attention that the applicant for Z4120 um, is asking that we move um, to have the hearing for that item on January 5th instead of December 1st. So I think this would have been caught in a normal in-person council meeting when folks could come up to the dais and tell us, um, but it's come to my attention that that was not flagged um, during our uh, planning commission report. So I think we need to make that change at this time. Which case is that? Z4120. Yeah, which, what's the name of it? Yes, ma'am. Um, it is the 7650-7630 ACC Boulevard. Okay. All right, thank you. Can we make that change then? Um, do we need a vote? So we you need a vote. Okay, is that a motion? That um, is a motion. Stewart? Yes, ma'am. Seconded by Mayor Pro Tem Branch. All in favor? No one's opposed, so that is unanimous, clerk. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I've got. Okay. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Branch. Yeah, I was. I had COVID on my mind and, and everything. I forgot to mention, I am having a district C meeting tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. It's virtual. Um, we will also, uh, even though it's via Zoom, we will show it via Facebook, um, but it's tomorrow from 6.30 until 8. We did in early last time. Um, so it's scheduled for 6.30 until 8, depending on um, number of comments and people participated. Okay, and um, Mayor Pertem, you are also covering Campo meeting tomorrow, correct? Yes, I will cover that for you prior to my meeting. Okay, thank you. If it's raining, I do not have to do the tree lighting. So I'll face with you before that. Thank you. I appreciate it. And can you send out contact information or share information with us about joining your meeting? Okay. All right. I just want to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and to echo others. Please be safe, wear your mask socially distance, don't take any chances. And I think right now, um, having an attitude of gratitude is a really important way to get through the times we we're going through. So um, thank you everybody. And thank you to our staff. I wish all of them a happy um, Thanksgiving and thank them for um, all of their service. This has been a tough year. We all acknowledge that and we are most appreciative. Okay, next we have appointments. Clerk, are you going to unmute yourself? I surely am. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm getting good here. Uh, the first item is the Arts Commission. You have one vacancy. Uh, so, so Mima Thomas received uh, seven votes, so would be appointed. Uh, the next is Stormwater Management Advisory Commission. You have one vacancy, but there were no nominees, so that will be on your next agenda. Uh, the next is Human Relations Commission. You have a vacancy for one alternate member, and Scott Phillips received seven votes, so uh, would be appointed. So you now have a full complement on your um, Human Relations Commission. Okay, the Madam, next. Yes. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk, if I may, Madam Mayor, um, I was waiting to see if someone had someone that felt that fill those requirements for stormwater, but seeing not, I actually have a name of April Sherman that um, I would like to um, nominate who will actually um, kind of help fill the void of the person who came off of the um, commission as far as representation. Council Member Fort also has somebody that she is talking with who does fit the requirements. So if we could just if we could we'll talk offline, I'll hold that Madam Clerk and I talk to Councilor for it. Okay, and Councilor Knight, yes. Uh, yeah, I also have, um, I'm, I'm working on this as well. Um, and I do agree that um, this is taking uh, too long. Um, but um, so I guess we will maybe have the best person available. Thank you. We also need to be mindful of diversity with this appointment. In other words, we just put it on the next agenda with no nominees at this point, and you can place your nominees on, on yes. your ballot. Okay. 
All right, the next item I have is an environmental advisory board. You have three vacancies as the term of Justin Stinkbell, Brian Starkey, and Jamie Cole are expiring. Um, Mr. Sinkbell and Mr. Starkey are not eligible for reappointment due to length of service. And Ms. Cole, has, who is eligible, has indicated uh, she does not wish to be considered for reappointment. So you have three vacancies there. The next item is Fair House and Hearing Board. Clerk, I just wanted to thank Justin, Brian, and Jamie for their service. That's all. Okay. The next item, Fair House and Hearing Board, uh, you have two vacancies, um, Clarice Williams and Annalie Lehman. Um, Ms. Lehman does not wish to be considered for reappointment due to some new other commitments she has to address. Uh, Ms. Williams uh, does wish to be considered, but so you have two vacancies. Um, Council Member Melton. You can let Mayor Pro Tem Branch go. I think we're about to do the same thing. Um, I move to reappoint um, Ms. Williamson. Okay, and you second then Council Member Melton. All in favor? Opposed? That was unanimous, Clerk. Very good. So you will have one vacancy on your ballot next time. The next is Parks, Recreation, and Greenway Advisory Board. You have one vacancy as the term of Jen Jennifer Wagner is expiring. She is eligible for reappointment as far as far as length of service and would like to be considered. I'll make the motion to approve that. Do I have a second? Councillor Bufkin, thank you. All in favor? Opposed? That was unanimous, Clerk. Okay. Uh, the next is the Substance Use Advisory Commission. You have one vacancy um, due to the term of um, Ricardo Young expiring. Um, he is eligible for reappointment and would like to be considered for reappointment. Okay. Um, his attendance record, he has not, he only attended to the last eight meetings, but said that was related to a sickness and death in the family. So um, I'm going to make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Councilor Fort, all in favor? Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. That was unanimous, Clerk. Thank you, and that's all I have. Okay, next we have the report and recommendation of the city clerk. Okay, I'll start again. Um, first of all, you have minutes of the November 4th and uh, November 10th meetings in your agenda packet for consideration. Do I have a motion? Mayor Pertem Branch, do I have a second? Councilor Fort, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay, I have one more item uh, that I failed to mention. Under public comment, we did receive a written comment once in relative to Dorothea Dix, and I just want, I have already forwarded that to Council, and I just wanted to make it a part of the record. Okay, thank and that's you. all I have. Okay, thank you. Let's see, then we have the um, important recommendation of the city attorney. Thank you, Mayor. I do have one item. Um, you may remember, council may remember at the November 4th meeting, one of the speakers during public comment had raised some questions uh, about what he had claimed were some conflict of interest uh, of council member Bufkin related to the Midtown St. Albans plan. I, at that time, council member Bufkin stated on the record, if you will, that he would consult with me to get an opinion. And that is what the council ethics resolution suggests that he do. So he has now done that. And he, as well as several other council members have asked me to speak about this um, publicly at the meeting and state um, what my thoughts are on that alleged conflict of interest, which is, is again, something that is suggested by um, the council ethics resolution. This is a specific case and a specific um, 
as I say, request that I speak on this publicly as opposed to um, what happened earlier in the meeting. Um, there have been subsequent emails making additional charges since then. Um, and again, I've looked at this and I'm ready to report back. Uh, the claimed conflict, I wanted to explain what it was before I talked about it, is that this is currently a city initiated comprehensive plan amendment to the Midtown St. Albans plan. Um, that is in Councilmember Bufkin's district, that's District A. And the uh, appears that the concern is that relates to the proposed future land use map designation for one area of, or sub area of this plan, which is the St. Albans Bush area. Um, the current future land use map designation for that area is business and commercial services. Um, when this initiated the comprehensive plan amendment, the staff original suggestion was to change that designation to medium density residential. Um, and Council Member Bufkin uh, at that time agreed with that and advocated for that change um, in some different places. Um, some of the property owners, particularly the one who voiced the complaint, does not want that designation change. Um, and so that's the dispute. It went to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission has recommended that it stay the same. It will come before council and you can make a decision um, when it comes. Now, I have reviewed uh, all of the complaints and the applicable city and state laws um, related to conflict of interest and legislative land use decisions. And in my opinion, there is no conflict at all with Mr. Bufkin acting as he did or making the comments or taking the position that he did or any other ethical violations. And I just want to make a couple of other points so everyone understands sort of it's sort of opportunity because there's been a lot of talk about conflicts of interest today, and I can maybe clarify some things. Um, first of all, the um, Midtown St. Albans plan is a policy. It's not an ordinance or a law, and it's going to come before you at a future meeting. And there's basically a couple of governing documents that you consult or you ask me to help you consult that relate to whether you have a conflict. And one of those is a general statute, which is 160 D 109. And another is your adopted uh, city council ethics resolution. So anytime someone thinks or charges the conflict, what you do is you go to those documents and, and analyze those documents. It's not just because someone thinks you do, or it looks like you might, you actually have laws that you look at to make that determination. Um, of the complaints that I have seen here have made any specific is that a specific provision of either of those, um, either the state statute or the council rules have been violated. Um, I have looked at them and studied them and I can't find one that would apply here. The second point I wanted to make is there seems to be some suggestions in the complaints against uh, council member Bufkin that the council has some power to remove council members if they feel they have a conflict or have act, acted in a way that they disagree with. And I just want to clear up that that's not the case. Um, Y'all are elected officials and you cannot remove each other. Generally, the remedy is if there is a conflict of interest that you, there is a recusal and the person does not participate in that vote. There's really no authority for some pre-vote disciplinary action um, before the vote. And the council has the ability to vote to recuse someone if they don't do it themselves, if the council believes there's a conflict. Now, third, um, when you decide what ethical rules or conflict rules apply, you want to look at the type of land use decision that's at issue. Uh, you may remember we talked a lot about quasi-judicial decisions a couple of meetings ago and the, how the rules are different for that than legislative um, Legislative decisions, uh, one of the big differences is in a legislative decision, you can talk to whoever you want to outside of the hearing um, and voice your opinion on things. That's what you can't do in a quasi-judicial forum, but that's not um, what's going on here. Uh, the a comprehensive plan amendment is a legislative policy decision. Um, that includes the future land use map. Um, I will say 
that that is not even covered under the conflict of interest rules statute that only applies to decisions on ordinances, which this is not. So one of the provisions that I looked at was um, 160D109 and determined that not only is there no violation, but it doesn't apply when you're only making a comprehensive plan decision. Um, I do want to say that the purpose of the future land use map, as you know, is to guide future zone rezoning decisions. You read uh, several comprehensive plan consistency statements today and as you know as long as you read the statement and adopt the right statement that you can consistently or inconsistently with the comprehensive plan and i think that that's important to note for a few things based on me reviewing this complaint there seems to be some belief that a comprehensive plan um, future land use map designation changes the ability to use your property as it's currently zoned and that's not true it's a policy direction future action and the underlying zoning relates remains the same and the property owner can use the property in the same way before or after the change in the future land use map designation. So um, the other thing, and you actually did one of these a minute ago, that if you rezone property inconsistent with the comprehensive plan or the future land use map, there is an automatic amendment to that future land use map. So uh, I guess the short answer is by advocating for a particular future land use map designation, it doesn't change the zoning and it doesn't change your ability to change the zoning in the future. Um, so again, what are the rules for when you vote on something like that? Again, the state statute is not triggered. Um, I, would, I would go ahead and, and let you know this um, because there were some questions today. What is the test under the state statutes to constitute a conflict of interest when you're voting on a rezoning as opposed to a, a comprehensive plan policy? And what the statute says is that the council member would have to have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact uh, as, a, as a result of the action taken. So it's a, it's a pretty high standard. It's direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial benefit by you or a family member. So that doesn't apply to comprehensive plan amendments, but um, since that's come up several times today, I thought I would reiterate what the state rule is. With respect to the council rules of ethics, um, they're essentially very close to the state law and are implicated when there is some sort of financial interest in whatever is being voted on. Um, the ethics resolution does not prevent a council member from taking a position on a comprehensive plan amendment or future map designation in their district, even if it's close to where they live. Um, this particular complaint, um, Mr. Buffkin lives near uh, the area, but he does not live in the area. Not that that would matter, um, but here it's it, worth noting that he doesn't. And basically that is what a council member does is comment on future land use policies for their district. Um, and then it's long been the practice in the city of Raleigh for council members to be involved in small area plans in their districts. So in sum, um, I've looked at this. I know y'all have gotten a lot of emails. Um, so that's one reason I wanted to, at, at some of your requests, state this openly. Uh, I do not believe there's any violation of the rules of ethics or a conflict of interest for a council member expressing an opinion on what the future land use designation should be in an area in his or her district or um, near to where they live. And Basically, if a property owner wants a council member to vote differently on a comprehensive plan, small area plan, the remedy would be to try to work with that person and convince them that it was in the best interest of the property owner, the district, or the small area for them to vote differently. Now, when this comes to council, um, basically the council will be given, as I understand it, a number of options in the staff report. You can keep it the same, you can change it density residential, there may be other other map that you can look at. And when each of you votes, you're entitled to consider Council Member Bufkin's position, the Planning Commission's recommendations, the property owner's positions, and 
whatever that you determine is the best decision is how you should vote. So um, that was a lot, probably more talking than I need to do, but I wanted to make sure that I explained everything so that I didn't get any questions later. I can, I can answer more questions or if council wants me to do anything further or look into this further, I'm glad to do so. So having said that, I will conclude and just uh, let me know if you have any follow-up questions or comments. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Council Member Bufkin. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of council, I, I hope that you see in the city attorney's report that this has been taken seriously. It's been uh, carefully considered and uh, I'm going to rely on her opinion and guidance and continue my participation in this process. Um, and and as, as she was concluding her remarks, um, what, what you will see at our next meeting, and I'll, I've asked the staff for some help with this, is a little bit of focus on, on the real policy issue that's, that's in play here and a little explanation of uh, how the process unfolded, how people were notified, how people might have not received that notice, although the city uh, did what they were supposed to or were required to uh, to provide that notice. So I've asked the staff to be prepared to do that at our uh, December 1 meeting when we consider this plan. And uh, I think that um, in, in our usual course, the uh, process will be fair and it will be deliberate. And um, I'm uh, hopeful that you will uh, uh, that we will all work together and make a good decision. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Buffkin. Um, Councilor Cox. Uh, so just to be clear, City Attorney, there's really no violation of the law here, but um, it just comes down to uh, the court of public opinion and, and how this is perceived. I, I guess that's the case. Um, well, uh, yes, there has been no ethical violation by the govern governing ethics and conflict of interest rules. So anybody in the area that disagrees with any position can come, well, to speak at the public hearing or contact any of the council members and state whatever their position is and make whatever arguments they, they care to make. And you have a lot of discretion to make whatever decision that you think is best. I will say for the record, during 10 years on council, um, a number of council members participated in small area plan um, processes. So um, this is not something that has not been done before. Um, so yes. All right, we are now going into closed session. I'm going to make a motion. Um, to enter closed session pursuant to GS 143-318-11-A6 to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer, employee, or prospective public officer or employee. So moved. Do I have a second? Um, Mayor Pro Tem Branch, thank you. All in favor? Okay, unanimous clerk. Um, let's take a break five minutes before we start closed session. Thank you.
Okay. Thank you. We have uh, completed um, the reviews um, of our city clerk and the city attorney and unanimously approved a salary recommendation um, for both of 2% um, increase as well as a $50 per month increase in vehicle allowance for the city attorney effective January 1st, 2021. Um, we, um, we are now adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.